Hello, folks. Welcome to Scratch the Surface. I'm E.J. Scott. Whoa, it's been a minute. It's been a minute since my last podcast. I want to say uh, thank you to those that do listen on a regular basis um, for checking back in with me. Um, I, I don't really have a good excuse of why it took so long. Uh, maybe I just needed a break uh, or something. Um, I have this this podcast uh, with Jim Perrick. Uh, I recorded in December, and uh, it happened with a few podcasts. A few of my upcoming podcasts uh, I've had for I've been holding on to for a while, um, and I, I, I guess I just don't have a good excuse. I'm just trying to get things in order in my life and uh, a house and a home, and I moved my podcast equipment and it's just all excuses i guess but um but i'm back i'm back now so uh i I, i'm I'm calling that a hiatus i call that a hiatus a little vacay um thank you all for tuning in though i really appreciate i've even been asked a few times like when's the podcast coming back and um it's really nice uh it's nice to know that some people uh are, are are or uh, paying attention that closely. So it's really cool. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I am back. So this is a podcast with the actor Jim Perrick, who many may know from uh, True Blood, mostly. Um, before I get into that, as usual, I am going to plug my sh- socials. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at EJ Scott and the podcast at EJ Podcast. On Instagram, EJ Scott 1106. I have a website, ejscott.com. Um, oh, there's a, a documentary called Running Blind available on iTunes. I believe it's also on Amazon digitally uh, and uh, Google Play available for rent or buy and for like two or three bucks. And it's about um, me going blind and uh I, I am going blind i have an eye disease called choroideremia and um uh, in 2012 i ran 12 marathons in 12 states in 12 months and uh, blindfolded and uh, uh a 30 minute documentary was made about it and uh, you can go rent it or buy it and check it out i hope you'll I hope you'll do that and uh, boop 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 i current well i don't know if uh, I, i'm Check my check the socials because um, I'm doing a lot of a lot of selling auction items on eBay. Uh, normally benefiting the foundation Finding Blindness. Sometimes it, it, it I change it, but for the most part, it's Foundation for Finding Blindness. Um, <clears throat> uh, so that's a fun way to uh, donate and get something cool. You know, a lot of times I'll sell signed. Uh, items like comics or uh, True Blood stuff or Daredevil stuff. It depends, but um, uh, whatever. And sometimes people donate things to me. It's really nice. Um, so go check that out. And uh, okay, well that's about it. Well, all right. So on to Jim Parrick. Jim Parrick and I uh, met up in Brooklyn, New York, in his home in Brooklyn, and we talked for nearly three hours uh, about his life. And it was a it was really good because I haven't seen him in a long time, and uh, he was on a show called True Blood with my now wife. Um, I've gotten married since my last podcast. Um, uh, so and they were on a show together for several years, and um, I haven't seen him since the show ended. And uh, it was really good catching up with him. We talked about a lot of stuff. We get in deep. We go deep. Um, Let's see, we talk politics, religion, family, growing up, acting, insecurities, uh, you know, self-doubt. Um, geez, we go, we go to a lot of places. We had a lot of laughs, too. Um, but it, it was really, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe cathartic uh, for both of us, maybe. It was, uh, uh, whenever I have a talk like that with somebody, it always, always makes me feel a little better even though they're doing most of the talking. Um, anyways, maybe you'll feel the same by listening. Uh, so there you go. This is my talk with Jim Perrick. Enjoy. Yeah, it was, It was. so I'm, 
met her about 10 years ago this month. Deborah, yeah. And they said, you guys are going to be heading into this story. But we could talk about that. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, ready? Yeah, let's go, dude. What are you, what are you smoking, by the way? This is a uh, Jewel. So I don't smoke cigarettes any longer. Okay, you quit. That's good. Does it bother you if I use it? No, it's no, non-toxic. No. Like, no, that's fine. All right. I was just curious. Do you start to uh, feel like you're floating, you know? Yeah. Let me know. <laughs> if I start no, to feel like I'm floating? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, know. It's fine by me. I used to smoke. Yeah. I used to smoke for a long time. I smoked. Yeah. So that's good. So this we could put this in there. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, when did you quit? So I quit for five years, and then... I smoked for about a year, quit for four years, smoked for six months. So you go back and you have a love-hate relationship with cigarettes? It just takes one, man. I know. It just takes that's one. That's why you don't do the one. You can't do the one. Well, like, that's what, that's what? how I've done drinking is, like, you don't do the first one. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, but it's like with cigarettes, I will say, you know what? It's summer. It's New York. Going yeah. through some shit. Yeah. I'll quit before Christmas. Right. And it's not like, I mean, it's right back to pack and a half a day. Yeah. Day one. My old like friend. My riding old a bike. Yeah, yeah. It's right there. <laughs> and it's like, oh, where have you been? But then, but then it doesn't take too long for all the attendant suffering. Of like, yeah. I feel like shit. I feel yeah. like shit. I, I emotionally don't like the fact that I feel like I must go have one. And you always smell like shit. You always smell like just ash and, yeah. and filter and shit and but yeah so then uh the plan was to quit and then somebody's like if you tried this this is this will be a nice way to quit yeah i thought okay um and tried it and i was like it might be a nice way to quit or it might be a nice way to like not even have to step outside mm -hmm. so like you listen to the joe rogan podcast in your room just like Right. And it's. Yeah. Are you addicted to that now? Do you think? Are you? Do you think you'll wean off of that eventually? I'm gonna drop it like it's hot. Yeah. Like I, I, I've, I've tried the wean off. Yeah. I've been like, just no. Yeah. And in fact, like before I go home for Christmas, it's just gonna be like, all right, little buddy, there you go. Because I got, I got, you know, nieces and family, and like, I don't want to be itching to like sneak off to the bathroom yeah. and hit it bad example for them to uh, sure yeah. yeah and I think it just makes people I think it makes my family uncomfortable yeah like what are you it doing it happens in our family too my brother smokes now and he's also an alcoholic yep you know he's recovered yep. he's recover recovering for yep. the last almost year and a half oh cool yeah and, Where, where's, uh, what, sorry where, where's he live he lives in uh, Lindbrook okay so I saw him earlier today oh cool cool um and uh, so he's doing okay, but he picked up smoking. Yeah. As, uh, we have uh, addiction issues in our family yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. stuff. And um, uh, so but, but whenever I hang out with him, I'm like, Ugh. like I, I, I haven't smoked in 15 years. Really? Is it that long? Thir 13, 14 years, something like that? Yeah. And uh, so when people, I know they, I could tell they just smoked. Yeah. You know, if yeah. They, or they're hiding it with cologne. Yeah. Or something like that. It's it's so uh, I'm like, oh yeah, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> and none of it works. None of it works. None you of just, it. Then you have two offensive smells, like too much cologne. Well, and there's no cologne that's like a better smell when it mixes with like yeah. just stubbed out cigarette. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Stale cigarettes. There's some that respond to that better than others. Yeah. But like it's it's yeah, it's not good. It's gross. Mm -hmm. It's gross. And I have nephews and I don't wanna you know, I'm glad I don't do that stuff yep. anymore, you know, um, so I don't have to. Was your brother's kids? No, no, my sister's kids. Yeah. Um, you have you have a sibling, you have a sister, right? I have a younger sister and she just had her second daughter. Second daughter. Yeah. She had two nieces. Yep. Um, and you're from, hi, I got a kitty cat it's here. A donut right there. Hi, Donut. I love Donuts, oh my gosh. She's, I might eat you. She's a sweetheart. Um... You're from Allen, Texas? Allen, Texas, so yeah. Cool. yeah. Um, you born and raised? No. So I get a lot of shit from my Texas family and friends about this. My dad was in the Army, so I was born in uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Oh, okay. You were born in New Jersey? Yeah. Okay. And was there for six months, seven months. Okay. And then 
back to Texas, and then that's where I stayed until I was 20. So you're a New Jersey boy. That's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was like, yeah. I, I, some of my friends from Texas will be like, you know, I was a Texan, and I'll be like, ah, it doesn't count. Dude, because you're not pure brand. Right, I, I, I guess you have to be born, like, born, born. Right, right. I don't know. Born and then never leave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you ever if you ever take a trip, like you lose you lose your card. Um, but I mean, I have I have no memory of New Jersey at all. Yeah, of course, it's none. I'd be impressed if you did. It'd be pretty wild. <laughs> My memory goes back further than what most people, I think, uh, believe. Even falling into a uh, a flooded creek. And then snagging my diaper on a root that was protruding through the side of it. It sounds like a cartoon. I do it a hundred percent. A hundred percent. If I, it, and it's the kind of thing that, like, if I didn't have like the testimony of my mom, I'd probably be like, yeah, maybe that was a weird dream. Yeah. But I like snuck it? out of the little baby gate, my right. little buddy, and I was like two, two something. We were in these apartments, and it had flooded, and we just kind of wandered out. Um, somehow like Jimmy the gate or something and I remember like I don't remember the whole sequence of sequence of events but there's these pictures and one is as we got near the edge him having this very nervous expression on his face I don't remember falling but I remember hanging by my diaper from this root that had come out of the side of the thing and could feel where my leg was scratched and then there were these kids and they're probably 10 or 12 years old and there were I don't know quite a few of them they were in these big yellow inner tubes and so they were inner tubing down the flood of this like creek hmm. and I remember one saying a baby and then them grabbing and kind of like pieces of them pulling me out and I remember the kid it was like kind of hefty and I remember thinking how slick his skin felt as he like grabbed me up and then I remember my mom says that you know and she was in hysterics that I just said I fall in the creek <laughs> that's that was crazy. Not, yeah, so that's that's the first first thing I recall. Do you have a a good memory in general? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, do you? No, my memory shit. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's why I take so many. I do a lot of picture taking and videos yep. and stuff. And Deborah gets mad at me because she hates that stuff. And she's like, she's be, like here. Yeah, be here. Be here. Just yeah. remember it. Yeah. I'm like I'm gonna forget it. Yep. So it's it's good for me to take these pictures so that in five years when I do forget it and I go through my picture, I go, oh, yeah, I did that. Right, right. <laughs> you know? I wonder what it is that determines why some people seem to have, like, a, str- a sharp memory and some people just don't. Well, and probably in my case it's genetics because nobody in my family has a good memory. Really? Yeah. I don't think so. Probably more than the utility. I think there's yeah. some people who kind of decide early, like, Mark that. There's, there's, uh, you know, writers are great with mm-hmm. memories. I feel like, you know, uh, storytellers. Yep. You know, they just remember. You know, some people know it was a Thursday. And yeah, it yeah, was yeah. Raining and and yeah. he was wearing a red shirt. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking yeah, about? Yeah. I don't remember anything. I I ballpark it by decades. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can't do the Thursday thing very often. Yeah. <laughs> But I can usually remember what happened and usually remember how, how it made me feel, mm. which I guess was, somebody was telling me once that like, especially with early memories, the ones, obviously the ones with the, with the strongest emotional connections are the ones that are like most readily available for right. us to recall. Right. Yeah. Um, you said your dad was in, in with the army or? Yeah. So he was, he was in... He went to Texas A&M and they have like, um, they call their Corps of Cadets. It's like their ROTC program. Uh-huh. And so he came, he came out of the army and he was already kind of fast tracked. And so he was a captain. And then his plan was to go into the FBI. Hmm. And like that had been kind of his dream. And um, I think as they got closer to it, he realized that that would be a lot of like kind of not knowing your family, like, and it's certainly not, not uh, allowing your family to know you. And like his dad, my grandfather had been a colonel in Vietnam. 
and then did some did some kind of secretive stuff with the drug wars over there in, in uh, Southeast Asia after Vietnam, like Cambodia, cleaning it up. Secretive stuff. What do you mean? Well, I don't, I don't, so he, he worked with something, something called uh, the CID, and then he worked alongside the CIA. Hmm. So he wasn't in the CIA, but he was, he worked with them, and I think, I think he liked that a lot, because at that point there were, you know, the shift was away from, from the war, and it was, it was kind of like uh, late 70s, I guess, mid to late 70s. Where's all this this dope coming from that's flooding into this country? And like, you know, we're we've already got people over there. We have personnel over there in Southeast Asia. So why don't we put it to use and see if we can kind of track where this stuff's coming from? Mm. And um, and I I imagine maybe that had something to do with my dad wanting to do that. But um, but then he made what I guess was a tough decision, man. Like. The idea of walking away for your dream, for your family, is obviously a pretty fertile ground for like good stories and stuff because sure. it's, it's such a tough decision. But you know, he didn't he didn't go to the FBI, and I had a great dad. So yeah, it all worked and out. Now in Texas, eventually, yeah, kind of kind of all around that area, and then I guess I was like four. So you we, just moved around a lot. It, not too it, much. It was like back to Jersey, and they had this little rental house. Then there was the uh, apartment that I fell into the creek uh, at, and then they got, they got a house in Allen when Allen was still like, I think at the time probably like 12 or 13,000 people. So it was, mm. it was mostly little suburban streets, not a lot of retail, not a lot of restaurants, but then, but then kind of all throughout it, there'd be spaces of land and people that were still farming the land and stuff mm. like that. So it was, you know, kind of uh, maybe half suburban and half rural. Yeah. It was fun. So what did he end up doing, like work-wise, did he when you guys settled? He went into the business world. He went. He went into banking, um, and then towards the end of the eighties, he started. Do you remember Ross Perot? Yeah, most, Ross Perot. Mo- mostly because of Dana Carvey, right? Like that's <laughs> <You're> like <right. laughs> for for guys like our age, that was the big. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so Ross Perot had this company EDS, it was Electronic Data System, and they worked with banks and all kinds of people, uh, I guess, helping basically computerize business. That was, that was their, their uh, I guess, main order of business was how do we get this technology that not everybody's using yet and kind of sell it or advise on how to use it. And so it, it doesn't sound like it was something that was very related to what he had dreamed of doing, but, you know, I think he was, he was good at it and, Found, found other interests. Do you like it? Did he seem happy with what he was doing? He, se- he seemed happier as time's gone on and he's found new places and new work. Like the the, the stuff he does now, he does like uh, Becky Software sales. So, so he's still working? Yeah, he's still working. I mean, and, and it's purely by choice. He said, I like this. Yeah. Oh, I like, okay. yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was pretty cool. And your mom? Mom is uh, just retired, but she was an English teacher. Um, and so she taught basic high school English. And then, and then I think early was teaching kind of uh, honors English or, or something more advanced. And then about, I guess, for maybe the last 12 or 15 years of her career, she taught English as a second language. And that's where I saw her. I mean, she, she always was really, really interested in the topics uh, that she was teaching. And she was always really good at exposing my sister and I to, like, you know, the great stories that they would be teaching long before they were our curriculum. But when she made the shift over to English as a second language, something really kicked in. And she seemed to be, and I guess, well, she talked about it, about how these were the people that were most grateful to be learning the language. I mean, guys like you and I, it's just, it's all class. Yeah, yeah. And it's all watching the clock and, like, just get me the fuck out of here. Right. But if you're, you know, if you're coming from Iran or Mexico or Taiwan or something and you get to learn the language, it's going to let you thrive in the place you came to because that's where it can happen. Like, right. they were thrilled. Yeah. And and I think I think that was, 
I think she liked that because it allowed her to be enthusiastic and the enthusiasm was met mm. instead of like whatever we probably did to our teachers. Which is just, <laughs> yeah. just shoot it all down. What were you like as a student, as a kid? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> you know, like on the report card when it's like has potential but? Yep. Yeah, some variation of that. Yeah. Um, has potential but draws, has potential but uh, seems to think he's the center of things. Um, <laughs> Daydreams. Yeah. Just in, in lazy, man. Like I didn't it, – it wasn't that I, w- I had like an aversion to learning. It's I didn't – I didn't like that somebody else picked a topic mm-hmm. and I didn't like the structure yeah, um, control. Was it like uh, you didn't have any say or control in anything? None, right? And that, yeah. but like here's <laughs> here's the thing. Like that's the deal for everybody. <laughs> right. Like that's how it goes. But as a kid, as a, as a kid, think that way, you know. No, and so I, I like like looking back, and it's it's funny just because some of the things I've been doing in my life to clear out the old and usher in the new has involved a lot of like looking back, like even that far back. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was part of it too was, um, you know, my, my thoughts were more interesting to me than whatever was being taught most of the time. Mm -hmm. And then there was also this fear, like this social fear of like, uh, I don't, whether it was true or not, I don't have a place where I fit or belong. You know, like amongst an outsider, amongst your peers, there. Yeah, I didn't get it. I didn't get like the easygoing connection and kind of shared thing that little pockets and groups of others would have. Mm-hmm. I tend to think I'm mostly invented. That like I, uh, I, I couldn't have it. that projected. Yeah. Certainly, yeah. Because um, I don't. They all think I'm weird or something like that. Yeah, or maybe just overcomplicated it. Like, how do you do this? How do you, how do you sit and talk with that group? And it's like, well, you know, certainly thinking with your eight-year-old mind is it going to be where you find the good answer there? But right. like, maybe you, maybe you, sitting down and eating with them would be a good start. Right. Why do you think <laughs> you were so insecure about that? Is you think moving around a lot as a as a youngster? No, because by the time I was four, we were pretty locked in. Um, maybe those first few years maybe could affect how you were. Could be, could be. Kids That's something. true. You know? Yeah, it could be. It, it really honestly was, looking back, EJ, it was like fear was just this huge part of like the beginning of things. And in like all forms, like I had a really loving family and really loving extended family. So there wasn't a fear of like... Uh, does my family care? Like that was kind of the one I could check off the list, but like I kind of accidentally saw some scary movies when I was young and the howling. Okay. You seen it? That's great. Who's in it? Uh, D Wallace. It's Wes Craven, right? Oh, I don't, is it? Maybe. D Wallace was in all the movies. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) She's terrific. (laughs) Yeah. But it was the first, it was the first, uh, on camera transformation of a werewolf. So it was okay. this stop action. This is pretty visceral shit. Um, but then there were these other elements that, that made it seem kind of way more integrated to the world we live in than your average werewolf movie. Like there were the relationship problems and somebody had been traumatized through uh, like D. Wallace's character gets duped into meeting this serial killer and rapist and then he transforms in front of her. So like he was already a bad figure yeah so it was it that's pretty intense so like two and a half like that's not the kind of movie when mostly what you're understanding is the images right you said that's how old you were two and a half when you saw that i i it's it began and i was asleep and then unbeknownst uh to my folks i woke up okay and just kind of like watched in a wide-eyed way okay (laughs) and you freaked out way too i guess totally totally because it wasn't just, oh, the people are good and the monsters are bad. It was like, oh, shit. Like, before that thing becomes a monster, he's a terrible, scary, awful person. Yeah. And my imagination just kind of ran with it. And then 
at my grandparents' house, um, they still had like all the books that my mom and, and her brothers and sisters would read like at college and they would just leave them at the house. And so there was a Stephen King book called Cycle of the Werewolf. Oh, yeah. You're, you're familiar with it? Oh, uh, yeah. They made a movie of it with uh, Gary B. Silver Bullet. Silver Bullet and right. Corey Haim. Right. And so in that, they picked kind of one of the chapters and elaborated on it. On right. it. But you remember the illustrations, right? Yeah, so, yeah. They're They're... Horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so here, like in the same year, there's this movie. Whoops, I saw that. Oh, that's a thing. This werewolf thing is real. And then what's this book here? You know, the only kind of book that could have made an impact would have had pictures, and it just happened to. And like, oh, that's the same shit from the movie. Mm. No good. And I, I mean, I went to I went to bed every night, certain like tonight's the night, man. And my my dad said I developed a strategy for it, which was to kind of say, well, I'm one of them, you know, and like we'd be on the way back from Chuck E. Cheese or some shit. And I'd be like, you know, don't let me see the moon or I'm going to transform. And I guess the I guess the strategy was, you know, they come through the window and I tell the werewolves, you know, I'm with you guys. You know, my parents are that way. You can go chow down on them. But like, you know, don't hurt me. I'm one of you. <laughs> <laughs> now you could really, really splice that up, like uh, in a therapist's office. Yeah. <laughs> and Have uh, you? yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Did you come up with anything? Yeah. Um, little guys and girls do some wacky shit when they're scared. Yeah. It is. It's usually either well, I'm leaving the game, like I'm checking out. I'm I'm gonna completely isolate. I'm not gonna participate. Um, or it's, well, then there'd better be a part of me that could become the thing I'm afraid of if, if it sneaks up on me. Mm -hmm. So like the fight or flight thing. Right. But, um. It's a lot for a two year old. It's a lot, dude. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> That's pretty intense. Yeah, it was a lot. Do you think that was kind of traumatizing to you? I mean, you're still memor you're still remembering it. I mean, all these years later. I mean, my, my best understanding of actual trauma is 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 the, of, of mental or emotional trauma is like something breaks mm -hmm. that, that like, you know, uh, somebody comes back from war and they have bad memories. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes back and they have post-traumatic stress syndrome. It's because the the thing that happened snapped something the same way you could break your arm, you could break your psyche. Right. And I, I think I was probably like at a nice like sprain okay. level, yeah. you know okay. what I mean? So, um, but then, age. but then it rolled over into this social fear of mm -hmm. like, you know, and, and I, and I think part of it too is I was interested in these things and, and, and my family, you know, when you're little, I don't know if it was like this for you, where like, there's no place you'd rather be than the, the young adults that are your parents, aunts, uncles. Or did you have that kind of experience, like as a kid? Like I only wanted to be around them. Is that what I mean? Not only, but like, what a thrill! It's yeah. Christmas or something, and they're yeah. all there, and uh, they're telling stories. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, I guess so. I I kind of kept to myself a lot. Okay. Like I had a basement. Yep. In uh, my in my parents' house. Mm hmm. So everybody would come over, and I was like, I kind of was. I'll just go do my own thing, you know, and maybe yeah. I'd hang out with my cousins or something like that. That was that was probably preferable for me gotcha yeah i did that with like my peer group mm -hmm. it's like school's that. out and they're saying let us go do this and i'm like give me a stick i'm gonna walk into you know this little space between the houses and for the next three hours it's a kingdom and like the only thing that could go bad is somebody comes by and says hey man what are you doing right and they blew it <laughs> <laughs> right like now uh, nothing. I, I was trying to kill a fly or something. <laughs> they broke the illusion. So, yeah. So with with kids, I was kind of like, I could go up into my head. And I think part of the problem was whatever came out of my mouth was coming from this overactive head. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't, you know, I'm not saying it was more sophisticated. I'm saying it was just uh, unrelatable. Yeah. Like. First and second graders are, who the hell knows what they're talking about. Yeah. But then, you know, here's some werewolf shit, some <laughs> weird metaphysical shit. And it's did, like, oh, the weird kid. Did that stuff stay with you all through your academics? 
No. No, okay. Because of a very uh, deliberate strategy. So we moved uh, between fourth and fifth grade. And I think probably some of the roots of, like, acting are in this, this little part of the things. But, like, there were these two kids at my first elementary school that were just effortlessly cool. Mm. Effortlessly. Or so it seemed, you know. Mm. Who, who the hell really knows? Yeah. So we're moving to another elementary school. And, like, I knew a lot of the students there from our church or from, inter- like, uh, kid sports stuff. So it wasn't going into totally unfamiliar territory. Um, but that summer I was just like, when I step into that school, I'm just going to be kind of this combination of the two really cool kids from Reed Elementary. So their mannerisms, their way of talking, particularly their way of not talking at all. Like you have to be pretty cool to be like nine or 10 and be stoic. You know (laughs) what I mean? Or eight or something like that. And I'm going to you know, see if my parents can update this wardrobe a little bit. I'm going to get, you know, the Zach Morris side spike <laughs> going. Right. And day one, um, I'm going to be that guy and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. And to me, it's a pretty good indicator that as, as much on the outside as I felt before, like I really fucking wanted in, dude. Like so I you, really wanted You looked in. at this as an opportunity for a restart? Yeah. Like the move? Yeah. You're like, I could, I could be, they don't know who I am. Yeah, they don't know. They haven't seen the dorky shit. They haven't yeah. seen um, the clothes that got made fun of. Right. Uh, they haven't seen, they haven't seen it, right? Yeah. They haven't seen the awkward social stuff. They haven't seen the failings. Um, and it's interesting, man. Like, looking back, I can have a lot of compassion for... Just a, just a twisted up little guy trying to come up with a strategy to get through. Yeah. yeah. But there was a period when I when I kind of looked back and said, dude, that's that's like where a lot of like self-deception and and the manipulating of others to kind of get ahead. You know, it certainly isn't where it came from, but it's like this indicator. Yeah. And so for a while I was really resentful towards myself for being that way. And then somebody put it put it to me and said, dude, couldn't it? Couldn't you almost admire just like a, a little guy who was, you know, didn't know how to ask for help coming up with a way to make the discomfort go away? Yeah. And at that point, you know, I went, yeah, not bad, kid. And then this person said, so, you know, you're 36 now. So why don't, why don't you tell him, like, good job. We don't need to do that yeah. anymore. But yeah, you, get, you have to give kids a break sometimes, right? Yeah, because yeah. I, I feel bad for kids all the time because even, you know, looking back on growing up in school, I, you know, I, I, was, I, I kept that loner thing going for a long time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'd be angry and I'd be depressed. I had great depression in high school. Um, and only after I got out of high school was I able to be like, start finding out like oh who am i exactly? yeah man. because you're you're putting on so many faces and disguises just to get through the day yeah and whether it's your parents putting it on you or your peers or teachers or what or tv or whatever you think is yeah is cool or or acceptable then you start go figuring out oh i don't have to oh, all that pressure shit is gone now right right now i can figure out who i am right because you you spot on. It's like there's some information coming in, let's say TV and and whatever kids we fixate on. Say, boy, they've really got it figured out. Yeah, like, Zach Morris. Zach Bor- Morris, or you know. Guy. <laughs> and we have. <laughs> well, it's like it worked. There was no consequence. It worked, man. And like, so there's the message, right? If you could that, then you get that life. Right. And that life was like unscathed. And I think if I recall correctly, didn't he like ace his SATs on accident or something? And something like that. And he had all three hot girls. All of them. <laughs> all of them. And then if they went somewhere, it's like the new hot girl can't resist. And it's yeah. like, and all he ever kind of did was ride his charisma. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I don't think that show like corrupted me, but it, <laughs> it certainly went. Things would be good if you were that. Uh, you're damn sure not that. Yeah. Hmm, so what do we do now? You know, like... <laughs> I'm not A.C. Slater. <laughs> no. No. And, and you know, probably the worst of all scenarios was... Uh, My screech? Yeah. 
Yeah, right? I mean, the re Vegas. Yeah, I'm closer to a screech. Yeah, no. who just isn't aware of what's going on inside him or around him. Yeah. Well, it's funny. There's no middle ground there, right? It's like Screech is the uber nerd, and then AC and Zach are like the super popular, handsome. You know, for totally like, different reasons, right? right? Like they're made of different moral stuff. Yeah. Like AC's cool because his confidence comes from the esteemable things he does. Yeah. Zach is cool yeah. because like that's how he came into life. Yeah. And and that's sort of you know, it's like that. Yeah. It's like, and, and then there, then there are lesser degrees, but then like, I personally never met somebody like a screech that's just like on a, on a pogo stick or something yeah. like his own confusion. Yeah. I feel like he's screech. Screech is probably on some sort of spectrum or something, right? Oh, he's gotta be, he's gotta be, <laughs> this so but here's cool. the thing that would have been the one guy being most true to himself. That's true. So in that... Because he doesn't even know to... No. Uh, to no. Help, uh, he doesn't have the introspection to say it ought to be this instead of that. Right. And he's pretty unfazed by the outward opinions. Plus, the motherfucker still gets to hang out with... All the cool kids. All the cool kids. Yeah. So he's not getting bullied that much. Right. So smuggled in there, and I'm sure really <laughs> unintentionally is like the most dangerous thing you could, you could do is be yourself. Yeah. Just yeah. your unadulterated self. Yeah. Um, that's where he has the other two beat. As it turns out, he's not, his self maybe wasn't so useful. So but, you moved. How yeah. did that go? Great. I mean, day one on the blacktop. This, <laughs> this, this, and I mean like. You had a chick on each arm. <laughs> well, I had, I had this kind of like, something I had never had was like, <laughs> it's so funny to talk about 10 year olds this way, but like, Mystique, man. I was I was either weird or saying weird uh, things, and like I I I didn't know any other way. And it's like, just keep your mouth shut and hang back, and sort of like walk the way that one kid walked, and do this and that. And no bullshit. Somebody ran up and said, "My friend wants to know if you'll if you'll go out with her, go study with." Her. I forgot how they said. It. I, think they, I think they said going together. Right in fifth grade, it changed as you went along. <laughs> And before I even said like, so who's, <laughs> who's your friend? I just went, yeah, sure. <laughs> and then. That seemed desperate though. Am I crazy? I was, <laughs> I was, uh, I can say that now. Like, sure, man. Like it was, it was like, holy shit. Like there's been this circle, whether I was really totally on the outside of it, I don't know, but it felt that way. And then there was this hope of like, but at this new place, I wonder if maybe if I, and within a matter of minutes of like, yeah, you're all set free for a little while. Somebody ran up and went, do you want in? I was like, yeah. I'll sign the contract. So then the message gets reaffirmed of like, uh, you're acceptable when you're something other than yourself. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, it sucks. So how, how long did you keep that up for? Uh, like 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> What is that true? Do you feel that way? Like a little bit? Pockets of it. Yeah. There were pockets. Like around, right around the time you and I met. Um, a decade ago. Yeah. <clears throat> was, was coming off of a couple of years of not being afraid to try to really live by my ideals, I guess. And like, and, and letting those ideals become clear to me without fear of maybe what other people might think and you know imperfectly but pretty pretty adamantly like practicing like you know if this is the kind of guy you want to you want to be like get out there and do that and there was there was this window of maybe like five to six years where um i liked I liked the trajectory that my character was taking. And then kind of went, um, and, then, and then things started getting good and I started to look to things to see how I was doing instead of these principles or these values. And just, just kind of derailed, man. And, um, and so, derailed. well, I'm trying to think of the, so, I, I was as surprised as anybody 
by, you know, I went in for a two-line audition for True Blood originally. And then Alan and I had a talk, and then he invited me into, like, why don't you become a regular? We'll expand this thing. And, like, it was a really, really generous thing. It's like uh, the kid running up to you, and you want to go stay with my yeah. friend. You're like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. And in that instance, it was really because... Um, I put an authentic part of myself forward and was okay with whatever the result must have been, may have been. And then it's like that thing, that thing took off and I got, I was, I was on this real creative kick, man, of like, you know, I don't care about this business or kind of what I'm thought of within it. I think that was probably protective, like for fear that they'd spit me out mm -hmm. or something like that. Sure. Um, the money is really good and that's fine, but like, man, I really, really want to be okay with saying uh, I'm somebody committing to being an artist and I want to develop that. And I want to I want to pull other people who want that in and let's go, go along and like, uh, like perpetual student and perpetual output. Like there was, there was a really prolific time where it was me generating things that, you know, nobody saw or anything like that, but they were really, really important to me because it felt like they were coming out of who I was. And what I discovered was it, I had become so reliant on that to like have any sense of myself at all that if there was a vacuum of, you know, if it was in between anything at all, I, I, I would feel like, oh shit, something's missing and, and try to, uh, I want to be very precise with this. And would basically say, well, destruction's a pretty similar uh, sensation to creation. Hmm. I did, again, this wasn't conscious, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was, I need that thing. There's this time where there's nothing going on. What if I just deviate? And what if, what if, you know, this, this ego that I really, really very naively thought I had put to bed once and for all. I don't think that's the way egos function, mm. but I, I had made this real effort in my early twenties when I quit drinking to like lay the bits of it that I was aware of to rest and say, look, man, why don't you be one, one of the many and see kind of what you can offer instead of what you can get. And, and I think I was spared a lot of bitterness by taking that attitude, but it wasn't, it's not the kind of thing you can trim once when you're 22 and then hope at 29, like it hasn't come back. Right. And I was also putting a lot of pressure on myself, I think, to, to maybe be to live up to my own creative ideal, which was borrowed from my heroes, and most of them happened to be like the best people to have ever done this thing. And so it felt like this race of I've gotta, I've gotta be creating. And, and then it kind of was like, or I could settle for just sort of a wild, um, like, a li like a lifestyle of the creative person. And so I don't drink and I don't do drugs, so that's off the table. But like, just sort of an impishness, like like a, a meddler. Um, and what's the story I can get into now? And like usually it involved um, some kind of romantic validation or attraction. Mm. And and I, and I hadn't kept an eye on that. And so... Do you feel like you needed to fill something? Of course, yeah. You know, that... Yeah. Void or whatever it is. Yeah. Do you know where that void was or where it came from? I did. I did like from the neck up. I, I meaning I, I could tell you, yeah, the void. I know what you mean. What you mean is that uh, that sense that you're incomplete. And so you're reaching to these experiences to try to fill that. And like right. on, on the one is. hand, like that's that's a pretty simple but true summary of that. What I didn't know was uh, the degree to which that thing was calling the shots and really started to. And like I said, there had been a shift from looking at 
my, you know, slowly but really developing personal character to looking at my life. So looking at, of course I'm good. Um, I get to work with these great people. In my spare time, I get to do these other things that I love. I got to you know, work with some of my heroes. I get to, I get to kind of follow every creative and artistic whim. Uh, I'm really happy, man. Like, and and I don't I don't know if it's this way for everybody, but for me, it's a it's a very slippery slope to being dishonest with yourself uh, or with myself when I start to look at my surroundings and kind of the state of things in order to determine how I am doing. Like there's some real obvious ones. If, like, if we go out on the sidewalk and I get hit by a truck, you know, that external thing is like, how are you doing? Like, well, not good. My leg's broken. I'm in the hospital. Right. But then there's some not so obvious ones of like, what's up with the void? That thing that's, that thing that's been there and mixed with the fear since uh, two and a half, three, four. That thing that led you pick this strategy of either fuck it, I quit in a rebellious way and, you know, you can take your report card and shove it. It doesn't apply to me. Or I really want in. Uh, how do I manipulate the way in? All those strategies, you know, um, and then a decade or so of, you know, a little less than a decade of pouring a bunch of booze and other shit on it, like, and kind of going, that's not working that's going to kill me and then the great relief of cool you don't have to have that shit anymore put me in this awesome spot for a while and I did the thing that everybody who had helped me get to that place warned against which was don't ever take it for granted don't ever say um, for a guy like me it's, it's a dangerous thing to say well I fixed that it's in my past and I'm good now once and for all you know, particularly with, with addiction stuff. Like, mm. it's not a one-off. It's not like, uh, you, you, you took it seriously for a few years and what do you know, things got good. Therefore, uh, they're going to keep getting good and you're good, you're cured. It's like, yeah, right. no, things were going good because I was being very deliberate. Mm -hmm. um, when, when did you start drinking? I got drunk for the first time at 11. Do you remember what the circumstances were? Yeah. I'll leave, I'll leave some of the names out, but yeah. Um, I got drunk on our bus uh, route to elementary school. In the morning? School. Yeah, in the morning. Oh, Jesus. There was an older guy. He was one of these guys that was like 20, probably. Like, he, he clearly... <laughs> he was 20? Yeah, he was, he was like a, he was a senior in high school, but he was... Uh, he, had, he had been held back, I think, a few times. And he was out kind of on... The, uh, 11, what grade is that? It's like... Fifth grade. Fifth grade? Yeah. Know, fifth grade, she's... And, you know, now that's also the new stage, and that's the new place to be the new kind of guy and the cool guy and all that shit. And, right. Um, but there was this kid that was... Uh, it wasn't a kid. He was like a young, very young man. Big-ass farmer guy, and he would bully the kids and pick on the kids. Mm -hmm. and, and later I kind of looked back and thought, well, geez, you know, what, what kind of... Treatment was that guy getting at home if, like, he couldn't wait to get on the bus right. and fuck with somebody who weighed 70 pounds or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, he was a pretty stocky dude. And um, I remember him, he pulled out this bottle of Great Mad Dog 2020 and said, like, called me a name. Um, I was like, I bet you don't even know what this is. And, like, I did in that I knew, like, oh, yeah, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to drink that. And, um... He was kind of teasing me, and everybody was watching, and so I thought, well, you know, I'll show them. Like, I've got to play the part mm -hmm. of this guy now. Yeah, I've been doing it for a year, right? Yeah, I'm still holding four months <laughs> into being, like, a cool kid. And it was, it was shit like that. It was always saying, what would the right move be? Yeah. And, like, in this case, it was go take the bottle and, you know, don't just sip it, but, like, drain it. Yeah, okay. And shit tastes like Kool-Aid, kind of. Um, I wouldn't recommend it as, like, if you're having dinner out... You know, don't don't break out the mad dog. Ugh. And so, like, a, and then doing that, the whole the whole bus was sort of like ah, like it worked. You're cool. It worked. And then this thing that I hadn't that I couldn't have foretold, which was this space opened up in me, man. This relief of like 
freedom from the how should I be? Do they see? Do they see the real me? Is I'm scared? Is I suck? All this stuff. Uh, is it working? Am I gaining ground? Am I losing ground here in this little playground world? These th- these problems that I've made, uh, kind of like the centerpiece of everything. Just fuck them. They're gone, dude. I'm flying. I'm, I'm funny without. I think funny without trying to be. Mm. Witty, brave. I remember there was a girl from uh, either like middle school or high school. She was very pretty, and she starts like fawning over me because I don't. I down this bottle and like mm-hmm. was flirty, and it was like all oh, the all, all the shit. Plus, okay, plus yeah. this like bodily and emotional lift of like, right. you know, we all know what being drunk is like, and that's the reason people get drunk. But yeah. like when you're eleven. And like you accidentally did, um, it's like, oh, what a surprise. This is doing something for me. And so it wasn't like, all right, from that point, I was on the bottle. It's like that began the thing of like, hey, you know what works? You know what works when like saying fuck it and ditching your responsibilities because you're afraid you'll fail or fuck it because you've disappointed somebody or or oh, now they see who you really are. Like, you know what works to just kind of like erase all that is if you tip the bottle, it works. And it does work. Mm-hmm. That's, 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 why it's, that's why it's a problem is like, yeah, it'll go away. You know, if we were sitting right here fretting over something and wringing our hands and then we both got shit faced, that thing we were fretting over would be gone. Right. Right. We'd be we'd be free well, it from it. Wouldn't be gone. No, oh, then it would hit us with the bill later, <laughs> right. right? Which part of the bill is the problem's still there. The other is, hey you kids, you're not supposed to do that for another eight years. Right. Why don't you get in the paddy wagon? Um another is now I depend on this thing that <laughs> that cripples me to get through the most basic elements of life. Did it did it get you right right off the bat i mean that that's a pretty major first off yeah and then i think so it was it was so vivid man it was it was it was it's so vivid in my memory that i'm like i knew all right this this is going to be a thing now Mm. and did you end up hanging out with other people that drank after that later yeah 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 and, and by the time, like, and I, I picked the people, not the people who were discovering it, but the people who were already two years in. There was a shift in who was cool. You what know, do you mean? From, from elementary school into middle school, you know, what had made somebody cool before was maybe they were charismatic and athletic and, or whatever right. it may be. And now it was, for me at least, with, with a pretty broken perceptor for these things, it was who's crazy as fuck. Like who's who's not afraid of shit, who uh, who's w- who's willing to enact uh, an agent of chaos and throw it all over the wind? I give a shit. That's like, where you were. Those are the guys. I want in. Yeah. And like, well, you can those be on the, the edge. troublemakers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you start yeah. where you always start. Well, that's which a is rush on the too, edge. right? So that's yeah. That's also another type of rush. And well, and there's kind of a twisted up validation of like the people who don't care about anything care enough about you to let you in. It's also like, those are the guys you don't fuck with. Right. Maybe I'll be safer. Right. Um, and those, those guys are tend to be pretty open to people that aren't going to judge them. I feel like, is that true? Do you feel it that way? Like the, the yeah. troublemakers are like, yeah, come on in for the most part. I think you're right. Cause yeah. You're like yeah, if you if you don't mind all the crazy shit we do, <laughs> and then there's usually a, like probably a, 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 like an authentic psychopath or two, right? In the group, yeah. That's yeah. like part of the reason we're saying hey, you come on, and it's like uh, someday I'm gonna cut your feet off and we're all gonna laugh, right? Right? But like, <laughs> but like, man, that's the guy I really wanted to think that I was. I wanted that guy to think I was special. Mm. Like the the more the more potential uh, the, like, I, well let me put it this way the scarier a person was to me whether it was like a girl I had a crush on and it was scary because of how far out of my league she was or a guy who was a nightmare and like these cats all ended up in prison and shit and like mm. something in me was twisted to like well that's where you set your sights like mm. that's that's 
that's that's a good thing to obsess about. Hmm. You know, could I get into the graces of like the most belligerent uh, psychos or you know the Madonna over here, like, right. and then uh, you know, and then all through my late teens and early twenties, it was like. I don't think I went full blown psycho like some of those people. I mean, some of these people just from little kids were like, "Feels good when we hurt you." Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't have that thing, but I had uh, feels good to get off the hook of failure by saying, you know, I worship at the temple of chaos. Like, let's see how crazy we can make things. Right. That was that was my calling card. How crazy can I make things? And everybody else will kind of enjoy it because like, oh, when that guy comes around, some crazy shit happens. Mm. We want to be around him. Um, did, did your family see what you were doing? They saw enough to be really concerned. Um, did you get along with your parents growing up? I, it's, it's really easy to say yes now. And I think what I mean by that is there was always a really felt and understood mutual love. Get it, getting along, it's like, um, I think we had rough patches, not as bad as, as like some people that I hear about, but I think it was mostly just, the, it, it wasn't like them kind of overreaching and trying to force me into being somebody I wasn't. It was like, I did the wrong thing all the time. Mm -hmm. And them saying, God, man, like, we love you, but, like, good God. Like, where does it stop? Because your dad was in the military. Yeah. And he's, yeah. A, he's, an orderly, he's an orderly man. Yeah. He's a do-the-right-thing guy. Did he try to, I don't know, get, like, get, whip you in the shape or something like that? You know, like a soldier? No. I think, I think he maybe had his fill of that. Um... And I tend to think, dude, like my dad must have made some contract with himself at a very young age, which which was, uh, I'm never going to beat this little motherfucker because mm. he never did. And it wasn't that I didn't at times really provoke that. Right. But I think, I think this is what I mean by like my dad's not only do the obvious right thing uh, kind of guy, but like. I think he's an introspective guy to, or introspective enough to say, you know, apart from just following the rules, what, what do I need to really partake in and what do I need to really not ever let myself be um, susceptible to? And I think just when I hear kind of about, you know, the way they were raised, it was pretty, you know, get in line soldier kind of shit. Right. And, the, right. and it got physical. And, um, mm -hmm. I think my dad made a deal with himself somewhere along the way. Well, no, that doesn't work. Well, where are your parents from? Are they both south, from the south? So my dad was an army brat. He was born in Houston, and they moved all over. All right. Well, um, your dad was in Vietnam and all that. My granddad was in Vietnam. Yeah. And then my mom grew up in Abilene, Texas, which is west West Texas. Okay. And then they met at uh, Texas A and M University. And um, are yeah, still, are they still married? Yeah, still married. How long is that now? Shot. They just were married forty years this year. Forty years. Yeah. Now. And so this was this was part of the confounding problem of like, and it led to a lot of like uh, self hatred, really. And growing up in, in this yeah, is it I had choices? I my my choices in light of the stability I was given that a lot of people around me weren't the love I was given that a lot of people around me weren't. And it made me just think poorly of myself. Like, you know, you have this loving core and a really loving extended family and you have models for right and wrong. And like, do you look back now, yeah. 20 years later, yeah. you know, do you, can you pinpoint why you mm -hmm. did that stuff now? Absolutely. It was a strategy developed by a child who was super sensitive to not getting it right. So whether that's you got the math problem wrong or, uh, hey man, we don't, don't do it this way, do it that way. 
Like, I was so sensitive to that shit that mm. it felt like there was no point in trying. And so, and it was really, really uncomfortable to feel like I can't. That was the big overwhelming bedrock belief is like, God, man, I ain't shit. And like, I can't, I can't. If I try, I'll fail. And the little tactic I developed was, all right, so fuck it. Mm. You, can't, you can't lose it that, right? Yeah. Um, you lose it everything else. Did you ever consider going into the military yourself since your grandfather and father? Yeah, on 9-11, me and, me and <clears throat> like, my, my best friend and I'm godfather to his children, like, we, uh, on 9-11, we woke up just pre, pre-getting sober. And we went, dude, let's go. Let's join the Marines. Let's, let's roll. And instead, we stopped off at, like, uh, this place we called Hippie House on, on Melrose in East L.A. and smoked weed with this, like, 60-year-old couple all day. And we're like, well, you know, we'll join the Marines tomorrow. <laughs> and then what do you know, the next day, uh, we just sat around and smoked a drink. And, <laughs> and uh... If you, do you yeah. think if you were not an alcoholic at that point or, you know, getting yeah. stoned and that stuff all the time, do you think you would have actually joined? Been motivated enough? Because that, that, the well, alcohol and all that took all the motivation away, it sounds like. Well, I was taking the, uh, the motivation away and then that hurt because there, were, there was this drive, right? Then the alcohol took the pain of that away. And help me execute the plan of like, fuck it, I don't care. Okay. You know, but like, I think at that time, I, it's funny because I just had this conversation with my dad last week. Mm-hmm. I think if I had showed up at the Marine recruiters and said, you know, I'm Marine material. I, I love Marines and later got to be really close with a bunch. I think they would have said, uh, no, you're not. At that time. Um, Why do you think that? Well, those guys really, really are about excellence, and they back it up. Like, you know, they're the, they're the branch of the military that doesn't draft. They're not going to take just anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think at the time, as much as I'd like to think, like, oh, I wasn't that bad off. I think they would have taken one look and been like, you know, why don't you go try <clears throat> Can, another branch. You can wash dishes. <laughs> yeah, why don't you go try being a, uh, you know, like a dishwasher in the Navy or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I wasn't... And, and then later, I got to work work with some Marines and, and just admired the hell out of them. And it was like, man, that also would have been the perfect mentality to have developed at that time of my life. Of like, you'd say you're going to do it, you'd do it. You tell the truth, you show up whether you're scared or not until you stop being scared to show up. Um, you become dependable. You become self-sacrificing instead of what can I get from this fucking world. And like, there was a code there that I just like, that really, really landed on me. I was like, man, these, these people, I have such admiration for those, for those people who really live by it. It's not to say that everybody that's in, in that position lives by it, but the guys that do, I'm like, Damn, that's impressive. I mean, do you do you meet these guys also and think about your gra- your grandfather and your yeah, father? Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Are- yeah, and there was a little bit of there was a little bit of feeling bad, like you know, my my mom's dad was uh, a decorated Korean War vet, mm-hmm. and like you know, I I have, I have another uncle that's in the Air Force, and like I came from this lineage. And, it, and almost like, what's it say about me that I didn't go that road? And I think mostly what it says is, uh, I wasn't built for that, or I think I would have, you know. L- later, I got some compliments from some of the Marines I worked at that said they thought I would have been a good Marine. And they kind of qualified it by saying they thought I'd be a good officer. And in the Marines, there's like, like the grunts are kind of like, yeah, the officers aren't really fucking Marines. <laughs> But I but, thought, you know, that felt good. But don't you think, or like what we were talking about earlier, if once you're out of high school and stuff and away from all that, you get to find out who you are. Yeah. And if you join the Marines and you said, to, you know, you chose it as an actor, so you, that's kind of more your path. That's my path is like... Than, than a Marine. Than um, a and I, I think I'd be better at 
for a time embodying as much of that as I could, um, respecting it, expressing it. Uh, I loved learning about it and soaking it up. But part of, I think, why I could, why I was able to treat it that way was, you know, when in six months you get to go be an actor again. <laughs> it was like, the driver did it. Yeah, well, and, and these, the these are the guys that I'm just, like, blown away by. Like, yeah. Yeah, David Ayer was in the Navy. He's he's one of one of my heroes in this industry, man. Like these, there's, yeah. I I think, well, I think if I if if I had gotten sober and then one of the Marines that came out, eventually this thing was going to emerge, and maybe I'd have been better off. It's tough, acting? tough to say. You, you I'm probably in managing my life as I pursued acting. I see. Yeah, but maybe in acting, hmm. maybe. That's interesting. So that's interesting. Um, so when you were, when did you decide to try acting? Did you try acting growing up? Like, or other artists? No, man. I, I, I wanted to, and was really drawn towards it. And I think, again, as a credit to my parents, they showed me, yeah, we watched all the little, like, childhood, uh, the, the kid fanfare stuff, but they also showed me good people doing good stuff and good stories and, and howling and yeah the howling <laughs> D. Wallace and uh, <laughs> uh, Children of the Corn was another early favorite um, but the one that really clicked was uh, Lonesome Dove did you ever see, mm. see the, the main I series? never saw it I always wanted to you like westerns at all? I have some if a good movie is a good movie this was good and um, the TV is a TV uh, miniseries yeah, it came out in 1989. Duvall. Duvall, Tommy Lee Jones, Danny Glover, yeah. Diane Lane, Angelica Houston, like all these really. But in Texas, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the Texas Gone with the Wind. So right. the book that it's based on is revered. Um, but there was something about Duvall in there. I think it was the first time I really associated an, uh, a role with an actor. So he's like, I love this role. But then it was like, oh, there's a guy behind that, you know, and he's not exactly that guy I'm, I'm seeing. He's not exactly that character, but without that guy, like, we're not seeing anything. And I remember thinking, that's pretty cool. And I'd already at that point been just acting out, shaking my head, right. you know, every chance I could get. The alley? Yeah, the alley, dude. The alley, <laughs> the alley was big, man. Between houses or something. Yeah, there were a lot of, there were a lot of uh, horseback, Charges and you know, the alley was a castle moat sometimes, all sorts of yeah. shit. But like, so you had an imaginary an yeah. imagination to you, yeah. Which, which I think maybe the the fear had helped sharpen. Mm -hmm. Did you think? Did you try acting in high school? Did you have plays and stuff? Right at the end. So right at the very end, I was like, "Oh, it's go time." This is where people are kind of saying, "This is what I'm gonna do." And by the way, nobody's right. Mean? Well, I mean, at the end of high school, it's like you have to make a decision now, because right. we're we're gonna we're about to stop telling you be here at eight fifteen every morning. Right. Like your little twelve year sentence is up. <laughs> <laughs> you're about you're about to be paroled out, <laughs> um, and you should probably know which direction to start walking. And I was like, I don't. I'm not good at anything at all. Mm. So chaos and stupidity and uh, well, at that point you had been drinking for five years or something yeah right? at that point it was it was About six years yeah at that point it was uh sloppy and scary and uh but it, there was also this really cool thing that i can't account for how or why it happened but like this just this comfortability rising up and saying why don't you just fucking tell people like this is what you want to do man and because you did want to do it? You yeah. You thought about it? And I would fantasize about it. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all the time. And, and I don't remember, man, like exactly what the moment was, but I remember just kind of saying, like, all right, just put it down on your schedule See, for senior year. You're going to be in the theater. Is it, was it hard for you because you, don't, you didn't know any actors? And That was a big part of it is, like, yeah, more than, at some point, more than what will my peers think. Right. It was more of a situation where it was like, dude, is this something people can actually do? Like, yeah. I don't see it anywhere. I, said, I, I have to, you know, go to Blockbuster Video or I have to go to the theater 
to see it. I don't see it happening in Allen, Texas. Yeah. Um, but surprisingly, it was a little bit. Um, but I'd also sort of like alienated myself from the theater kids. You know, I was, I was just a psycho, dude. I yeah. was nuts. And and I remember me and a buddy of mine getting, I don't remember what, we took some pills. We were like in 10th grade. And we broke into the theater and they had a full-fledged rehearsal going. And we like took the foils from the players and like chased everybody, including the teacher, off stage, like just blown away on shit with these swords and like, you know, and then we were like, even then, like, yeah, that's real acting. Like, we're, you know, like, just, just nuts, just nuts. And so it was like, oh, these, you know, this guy's a jerk off. Mm-hmm. And they might all think it's silly what we're doing over here, but we like our, we like our acting. And there was one teacher who was like super, super dear to me, this uh, lady named Carrie Howell. And I think she was amused by the, sil- the ridiculousness of things instead of put off by it the way some other people were. And I think that somewhere in the midst of that craziness that she could see, she also thought, like, uh, the, this guy might have something and maybe nobody's told him that. Mm. And she did. And it, it meant a lot, man. Like, way more than I thought it would. Because I was... What she say to you? Well, so I was... As a senior, I was in, like, theater level one. Like, like the... Just... The thing you have to take so you can graduate. Hmm. You know, the, you have the, to take a theater class. You had to have some sort of performing arts or arts something. And it was okay. like, it was like, like, for example, there were guys from the football team that were totally, totally opposed to the idea of acting. They were like there because they needed the credit. Right. And so it started there and we did some things. And, you know, I had built it, I had built this thing up so it didn't matter what teachers said because what they were going to say was going to be disapproving. And I thought I had some nice armor against anything they could say. And she kept me after and said, what do you think about moving up to, like, the advanced thing? And I, I was, like, flooded with this feeling of um, encouragement that... Mm. It really caught me off guard. I, I'm sure I played it cool. Well, yeah, you know. But I left there going like, okay, like, see? This this um, sneaky suspicion that I have might... It, it just got co-signed. Mm. <laughs> and it's weird, because all she said is, how about a different kind of high school theater class? But it had the impact of, uh, this is what you do now. Wow. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. And yeah. Did, so did you? So you did a play, or did you do a play or anything? I did a play my senior year. Um, I got suspended my senior year because I I went to a play. The first play I tried out for, somebody else got the part. In an intermission, I went out and got hammered in the parking lot, and the cop rolled up on me and my buddy. <laughs> and so I spent like three months in this like in this hallway that they kind of sequestered off. Three months. Yeah. That was the suspen- suspension? Yeah, yeah. Three months? Yeah, it was either like you're out of here or I think there were like four of us. Um, you're down here, you get here an hour before school starts, you leave be- an hour before school goes, you don't socialize, you don't do any of this stuff. Ooh, that's rough. But it was cool because I realized, you know, I just read, just read books. <laughs> like, like, just books that interested me. And... Did, did they teach? They, there was no teacher or anything. No, they'd give you. They would come in once a week and say, and hand you kind of a packet and say, "Here's the assignments for the week." Oh my lord! So I'd just bang them out, <clears throat> and I realized when there wasn't a classroom to kind of like serve as an alternative choice of what to do with my time, uh, I could read it and comprehend it, you know. But if there was a class there, it's like, ah, why work when I could engage? Right. Um, and without that, I was like, all right, I'll do this. And I think actually my grades went up. No kidding. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. That's funny. Um, so then I did, I did a play in the, in the spring. After okay, suspension? Went, after suspension. Yeah. We did uh, the, one, <laughs> the one act version of Much Ado About Nothing. <laughs> which means they only threw four acts of Shakespeare into the trash can but like that's that's the way it's structured mm-hmm. and so uh, I played Don Pedro and here's you want to know my technique sure 
I rented the movie version from Blockbuster. Which one? Which one was that? Uh, was that uh, Kenneth Branagh? Yeah, Denzel Washington. Denzel plays Don Pedro. <laughs> right. And I tried to memorize down to every inflection exactly how <laughs> Denzel said all his lines, <laughs> and just went out with like, and just so confidently was like, "This will be great," you know. I'll do a Denzel Washington impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a great, he's a great actor so why not dude yeah 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 but I mean it was it was it's, until you kind of I, I guess there's some people and I've heard like Jack Nicholson was this way I've heard James Dean was this way that there's some people who just have an instinct that maybe just acting enough sharpens it and they become great but for most people I know if you don't have a way to begin you do some really wacky shit like if you don't have if you don't have some sort of uh, techniques a little sophisticated, I mean even beneath that, even more rudimentary than that, some idea of what you might attempt, right? Mm -hmm. You're gonna do some wacky shit. What'd you do? Denzel Washington impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was what I had. That's the way it is. Could I pee super quick? We pause. Yeah, this? yeah. Go ahead. All right, cool. This is great. You need anything else? I'm okay, thank you. All right, cool. <clears throat> Good? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not uh, boring you with the details. No. Cool. Let me grab this real quick. Um, I'm getting over this sinus infection. Mm. Has anybody ever just flipped this whole thing on you like an episode of like, here's the EJ Scott story? Yeah, a couple times. That's cool. <laughs> I like that. I have Matt Walsh from Veep. Yeah. You're Matt Walsh? Yeah. Uh, he's a great improviser, but he also studied psychology. Oh, cool. In college. So half of it was him asking me questions. Like mining away it. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, who else did that to me? A couple of people. Yeah. Um, which I don't mind. Um, acting. Yeah. Theater. The theater. <laughs> Yeah. Get closer if you can. Yeah. Um, hey, kitty. What's up, Donna? Hey, kitty. Um, so, okay, so you do that play. Yeah, you have, how'd you feel walking off after you did it? Was it like a couple performances? Like a king. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just, I was, it was just so exciting to be doing it, man. Um, I don't even think, I don't, I don't think if I had done a bad job, I would have sensed it at all. Yeah. It was just so like, oh man, I get to do it. I nailed Denzel Washington. Yeah, nailed it. <laughs> They've all got to be out there thinking, why is this so familiar? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, well, and your what about what your parents think? Were they encouraging? Yeah, they were. They were. I think like a lot of people. Well, 
So now you have the backstory on what they would have seen from me when I then sprung on them, hey, you know what I'm going to be? Uh, I'm going to be an actor. It's like, well, here's what we've seen you do. Um, Did a Denzel Washington impression. <laughs> not even that. Like, you've just been a little nut running around. Oh, yeah. Uh, you don't have any follow through. Right. You're always in trouble. Uh, you make things hard for yourself and others. We've been trying to save you from that. And now the life plan is to be an actor. And you haven't uttered a word of interest about that for 17 years. That's about right. <laughs> yeah. So there wasn't, there wasn't a discouragement, but there was a pretty serious, do you, do you know what that means? Or like, you how about, really? how about you? Of course I didn't. But yeah. of course I said, yeah, I know what it means. It's what yeah. I am. And like, yeah. I got very defensive, I think, unnecessarily. Because I think they were, I think my dad in particular was saying, rightfully, well, how the hell do you, how the hell do you put food on the table that right. way? It's like, who, who knows, man? Yeah. I don't know anybody who knows the answer to that today. Yeah. <laughs> going to go give some 17 year old kid the acting advice version of here's how, here's how you make it. Mm -hmm. Like, here's how it becomes your job. Like, who the hell knows? If somebody knows they should write a book. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Um, that's why it makes me laugh when, when people who, who've never tried acting yeah. criticize actors and say like, you know, they look at whoever, uh, uh, somebody that's successful yep. and they go, Oh, that guy doesn't know what it's like. He's just he spoiled in, in, and he's rich and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yo man, you, he did the impossible. He rolled the dice hard, hard. I mean, <laughs> yeah. by the way, yeah. you who criticizing him could Try also. Try anything. You can you can choose the same path and be just as rich, but you have to you have to succeed. Yeah, so that's hard. And then how do you see, do that? It's like it would be better. It be it would be better to write a manual. Here's it how you know he, uh, how not to definitely fail. Yeah, <laughs> like how that to definitely fail. That you could codify a little bit. Yeah. Like how here's some things to not do that would ensure that you blow it. Right. right. That would be way easier and way more useful than here's how you make it, kid. Right. Right. It's, you know, what you were saying about noticing when people kind of glibly toss off comments like that. Like, yeah. Oh, they're fucking. Yeah, yeah. I see people do that with athletes all the time. Like they're being paid so goddamn right. much and this and that. And it's like, well, do you think you work harder than that guy? I mean, your guys run some marathons, yeah. right? No bullshit. No, no. Like work on a different level than almost any of us, maybe outside of the military, understand. I would never <laughs> criticize the athlete. No, I've never understood. Like they give them that. all that money. It's like, well, they also return quite a lot. They well, have some value, but like they work their asses and then off. In the next game, they could break something and their career's over. It happens. Or all die. The time. And they or can, die. Or die. Yeah. Or get uh, concussions or, you know, yeah. or who knows what. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're risking a lot, their own health Yeah, all the time. Yeah, Which, you're right. You're putting a dollar amount on, I guess there's some other professions like this, but like, what's the dollar amount that every time you suit up to go to work, it might be your last day, you know, I mean, NFL like football. Fireman, sure. You know, or a cop or yeah. something like that. These guys get all this money and it's like, hey, don't worry, man. It's not you paying for it. Like, <laughs> you're, you're, you're cool. B, to say, oh, it's all they go out and fling the pigskin around. It's like, no, that's what we did. Right. That's what, like, bum-ass dudes did in the yard. And yeah. that ain't what they're doing. And if it's so easy, then you should go do that. Yeah. Then you can get all that money. Go look at their schedule for a week and see if all they're doing is going and flinging the ball around. Yeah. <laughs> like, I bet, I bet there's a lot of output. And I don't know what happens because, you know, there's no shelf life to an athlete like that. Right. What happens to, I see some of them are like announcers or whatever, but I don't know what happens to a lot of them. Do they? Do they I don't either, man. I know that. Probably most people don't. I mean, do they go broke? Do they get set new jobs, you know, like an office job or something? There was some stat, and it might be off by a couple percentage points, but it was something like, something like 80% of all in, NBA players are broke within five years of retirement. Include, including guys that, you know, pocketed $150 million. It's like, mm. and, 
you know, so then what? Uh, I think actually Alex Rodriguez has a show where he goes to some of these athletes that have kind of blown it, and he's like, let's help get you oh. going. Let's see what you're good at. Let's see what you're interested in. What, what kind of show was that? Like, it was like a reality show, and the, the first guy he did it was this guy, Joe Smith, who had, a, who had a really good, solid NBA career, and a few years after retirement was like, count, count and change and shit. And, like, mm. um, and he, had, he had a good idea, but he didn't know how to see it through, which was he was doing basketball camps for kids, you know. Mm. And Alex Rodriguez rolled in there and said, we got to get real. These problems are real. You got to start spending differently. Looking at this, and let me help you build your business up. Yeah, pretty cool. It's it's pretty cool. And I guess the the problem with guys like that is that their I guess some of their education there was all focused on sports. So How could not it not business be business guys? Right. Not, you know. Right. Uh, they, you know, who knows who, where their money goes to, and what's who, how many times they get swindled or whatever. Oh, that's the other factor. Is like contracts and, and and you've been around like the entertainment business long enough to know how often does somebody make it and like people just start picking them apart i mean it's family it's probably less than one percent people yeah that, that are successful at, at yeah something like this yeah right right um and then even then it's like it's it could end tomorrow even after yes it doesn't 100 percent. every time deborah is unemployed she it has a freak out, a little freak out of like, uh oh. I know, and <clears throat> I, I've seen her do that a few times, and I've just been going like, "You, you, like you gonna?" But she, in in a strictly practical sense, she's right in that. That might be it. You might be done now. Yeah. Like, it's I also don't. Her I don't. Father know. talking. Oh, is it? Yeah, totally. Her father. Is, yeah. Is echoing in her head. Sure, man. Yeah, because he doesn't want her. To, he doesn't want her to die. My dad's that. That was the whole thing. I wasn't discouraged. It was a real, a really, really practical man was saying, "Show me how this works, and show me why you." Right. When what we've seen is. Well, same with me. I yeah. was I was drawing my whole life mm -hmm. growing up, and I was going to art school in Florida. Uh, my my grades didn't weren't good enough. I got booted. Yep. And, but I always thought about acting, never did it. And, uh, one day I just decided, Hey, I'm going to be an actor. And I told my, my mom Yep. and we were driving. I remember she was driving and I, was like, <laughs> I thought for sure she was going to drive off the road. Yeah. Uh, but they were, just, my parents were just like so confused. Like you never showed an interest in this, but I've always thought I've always admired actors. But I was so shy as a kid. I was right, right. Really shy. Right. Um, well, why? Why do you think you were shy? Oh gosh. Well, I was depressed. Yep. For a lot of a that'll lot do of stuff. it. Yeah, depression. Uh, really bad uh, in high school. Mm -hmm. But then I was just, I was just a quiet. I was kind of a quieter kid in a loud family. Like I could look back on this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty clearly, even like this past Thanksgiving a few days ago. I was at the kitchen table and everybody, uh, at the dining room table, everybody's being loud and I'm just sitting there and <laughs> pretty quiet. Watching, observing um, it all. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, I, and I find myself, even in situations where people are kind of loud to each other, I kind of shut down. I don't like yelling yep. and trying to talk over each other. Um, I much prefer like what we're doing right now. Like, yeah, I can yeah. talk and ask questions and be vocal or whatever. Yeah, um, I, I much prefer that. So, so it's interesting. You know, growing up, I was I just felt like I didn't have a voice or, yep. you know, nobody cared about what I had to say or anything like that. Um, so then. But I always admired actors because I was, you know, maybe the same thing. Not Zach Morris, but I loved uh, Michael J. Fox. You know, sure, he was another guys. one. And uh, oh, and I was like, yeah. that guy's got it made. That guy is the greatest. And uh, uh, you know, Mike, uh, uh, Marty McFly, yep. and Alex P. Keaton. Yep. Um, I really admired him, and uh, and I, I just was I was in awe of like I didn't know any actors or nobody in my family was an artist. Right. So I just knew it was really interesting, and I was like, well. Yeah, I mean, somebody they had to at some point decide to be an actor, yep. and then just go for it. 
And then that's what I just kind of did. And, and now look at me. <laughs> well, yeah, but look. But I made decisions. I'm glad I did it. Right? You know, and I'm still acting on small, on the small level, you know. What are you, what are you doing these days? Well, I'm, uh, well I, I'm about to start uh, teaching improv. That's awesome. At Second City in Hollywood. That's awesome. And hopefully get back on stage and do more stage stuff. Yeah. You know, because I yeah. miss it. I miss doing comedy. So did you do that in Chicago for a while? Yeah, in three years. Yeah. Um, I think you had just left Chicago when we first met. Or maybe you were still living there. I, when you and I first met, that was probably season two. Mm -hmm. So I was living in Chicago at that point. Because um, Deborah and I met, and six months later, I left L.A. Yep. And moved to Chicago. And, and I did a lot of improv there. What's I, that world like? Improv? The Chicago improv world. It's enormously unhealthy. Bare, it's bare knuckle, right? <laughs> kind of. It's hilarious, <laughs> yeah. but it's really unhealthy. I talk to other improvisers sometimes on my podcast, yeah. and they talk about just the drinking. There's so many alcoholics. Yeah. I mean, I've talked yeah. to a lot of like recovered alcoholics, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Recovered yeah. alcoholics and improvisers. A lot of drugs. You know, like John Belushi. Yeah, man. Those guys... Dan Acker, you know those all those SNL early guys were improvisers and sketch guys. Right. They were all doing coke. Was Candy from there. Chicago? Candy was, I think, Canadian? Because he was on SCTV. Oh, you're so right, you're right, you're right, yeah. Um, but there was that wave of, like, Chicago comics turned actors, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's Bill still Murray. happening. Is he a Chicago happening. guy? Bill Murray, Chicago. Yeah, yeah. But even if you look at SNL... Uh, this, you know, the next SNL, um, there's a few from Chicago. I, I yep. know some of them from Chicago. Mm -hmm. So I know that, well, I've seen um, SNL auditions with Lauren Michaels in the room. Wow. And wow. And he's, he's scouting. Yep. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's wild. So I, was, I, so I was hoping to sort of do that. Yeah. I, I wasn't like, all right, I'm not, I don't necessarily know I'm going to get SNL, but... Uh, that'd be great if I did. Right, <laughs> and, uh, right. If I, but at, at the very least, I'll go to Chicago and I'll give it my all. And I was gonna break up with Deborah, and I, she didn't let me. So <laughs> good move. <laughs> so that's that. Well, I just just felt like it wasn't fair to say wait while I do this. Yeah, I was yep. because we had just met. I'd already made plans to move when I met her. Yep. And I'd never had like a really long relationship, mm -hmm. so I didn't know that we'd still be together by the time I left. And she was doing really well when we were dating. She was yeah. booking stuff at one after another, and uh, I was like, "Shit, she's gonna do great." And I'm, I, and I was kind of like, "I don't know what I'm doing," but she's uh -huh. she's uh -huh. got it together, and I'm just tr still trying to find myself at 32 years old. Right. And um, so I was like, "You go." be an actress and do your thing in Los Angeles. You're gonna, she's going to do great. And I'm going to go try to figure out whatever the fuck I'm going to yeah, do yeah. in Chicago. And she was like, no, I'm not letting you. <laughs> so, That's so cool. Uh, so I was like, okay. And I spent three years there. Yeah. Um, giving it my all. And, um, and then at a certain point, she's like, we're still together. What are we, what's going on? Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, I guess I'll move back. Yeah. So I didn't think we'd be together after three years of long distance. That's crazy. That's cool, though. That's for crazy people. Um, but I love improv. Yeah. I love it, and I miss it. But it's totally unhealthy. Because I'd be up, I'd be drinking all night. Mm -hmm. uh, and then afterwards, me and like my friend would go to Denny's and eat just the shittiest food. And in and, and my early improv days, I was smoking, too. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was gross. I gained like 30, 40 pounds in Los Angeles in like a five years. Wow. Yeah. Just just carrying that lifestyle over? Just sitting at the bar. Yep. Watching shows. Yep. Doing shows. And, you know, you go to the theater, you're on stage for a half an hour, and then you're there for another four hours. Right, 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 <laughs> right. And just yeah, as they rotate the shows and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And then... You know, uh, PBRs are two dollars. <laughs> so. Is Chicago so like? All right, I think of like in Chicago. I, I started losing weight in Chicago. Yeah, because I was like, "Fuck, I'm, this is getting bad." This yeah, this is getting bad. But it's hard because 
I ended up uh, sequestering myself a lot of a lot of the time because it was hard being around the drinking and the food and all that stuff. I get it. So I had to kind of just stay away from it. Yeah. For a while. Yeah. Do you do you think that Chicago has for for comedy in particular? All right, so you look at you look at like the comic scene in New York, and it's like, well, of course, this is this is where showbiz goes down. And you look at LA, and you say, yeah, that's where it reaches the screen. Mm-hmm. Is Chicago kind of like a bastion for that? Because it's a tough fucking place, and people need to laugh. I guess it's always been a theater town. Yeah, you know, you got Steppenwolf there, and um, some really great theaters, and oh, is it here? Yeah. Oh. Um, uh, but you know the improv scene is embedded for 30, 40 years Second City is there 60s? yeah maybe 50s 50s, 60s something like that so um, so it goes way way back I'm not sure what it's like these days I I hear because things have changed so much and everybody I know that was in Chicago almost are now in LA Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it I, th- I still think it's a good place to go if you're thinking about being a sketch or imp- improviser. Is it pretty sink or swim? Like, if you're not good, if you're not funny, they you don't, can, they don't tolerate you? Or, no, or, they'll tolerate you. Yeah. There's always, and, there's, and if one theater doesn't, you can find it one Yeah, one right, well. right. Um, but if you're, like, uh, Deborah's cousin was asking me about it, and I didn't get a chance to tell him, because uh, he's in Italy or something, but... Uh, if I get to tell him, I'll say, well, you should probably go to Chicago mm-hmm. if you want to, you know, go for Second City <clears throat> and uh, spe- probably especially Second City at this point. Yeah. Because uh, they still have sellout shows on the main stage and the two main stage shows. Uh, That's cool. Two main stages. Um, so it's pretty massive there. That's cool. Especially 20 years ago, probably. Yeah, yeah. Tina Fey. Yeah. Rachel Dratch, you know. Uh, Tim Meadows, Bob Odenkirk, Chris Farley. Yeah. You know, all those guys. They were all coming out of Second City? Yeah. Damn. Did yeah. you see the new Sandler special on Netflix? I saw... Uh, I saw... Did I see the whole thing? I might have, but what's funny is I know all the, all the jokes and all the songs because I, I go to this place called Largo in L.A. Yeah. And he was working on that material out there. So I saw him do a ton of that stuff out there. So That's it's so funny cool. watching it in the special now. Yeah. I see Largo's a great place because everybody's working on their Netflix specials there. Oh, really? I saw Ellen DeGeneres do it. Yep. I saw a bunch of people. Uh, <laughs> I saw Louis C.K.'s last show before the shit hit the fan with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was interesting. Patton Oswald. I see lots of people. Is he Chicago? Patton? Oh, Patton? I don't think so. Is he? I don't think so. It's yeah. funny, man, because I remember... So you know Janina, right? Oh, yeah. Very well. So, like, I guess this was 2013. She... Janina Gavankar. That's right. She had become friends with Chris Rock. And she said, do you want to come with me and watch Chris Rock do this little set? I think it was a comedy store. Mm-hmm. And I was... Yeah, let's go. Of course. Like, of course, man. And we go, and... You know, what, what, any, anything that I had known about Chris Rock is him and the element once the performance has begun. And he seems like such a, a like a brash personality, right? Right. And we get there and he's kind of like pacing around, nervous and shy and he's soft spoken. Like, hey, hey, man, nice to meet you. I like the show. Oh, you got to meet him. That's cool. Yeah, super cool. And then he does the show and just fucking murders it. Just awesome. And then after, it's right back to like, yeah, well, you know, what, what do you think? Is that okay? And I said, has it been a while since you've been up on a stage like this? Just totally ignorant about how comedians do mm-hmm. things. And he said, no, I don't, I don't think there's been more than five days in a row for the last 30 years that I haven't gotten up and worked yeah. something out. Yeah. And that was such a, in, in some ways, like a surprise because like, wow, even, even you, you, you just always tooling the thing and, and, and practicing. But then also like, yeah, that's, that's kind of what everybody who's really, really good at something that involves getting up on a high wire, like, yeah, they're, all, they're always doing it so that they, they don't die. There's a great <laughs> right? documentary called Comedian uh-huh. uh, by Jerry Seinfeld. 
and he's in it, and this other guy, Arnie, Orny Adams, is in it. And it's a great juxt- juxtaposition where you see the massively successful comedian versus the guy that's still trying to trying to do it, you know? What's the line of distinction, would you say? Is it um, a work ethic thing, or is it a... Well, Orny's really... Orny was really passionate and very... Um, and he was really going for it. I'd say probably just quality of jokes, really. Yep. Um, and probably luck. Yeah. Probably some of it's luck. Um, Do you think there's a funny gene? Like, I've heard people talk about it almost ironically, but, like, it's, it's an I interesting think, thought, right? I think... Uh, I think it's hard if you ne- if you don't know anything if you come from a family that's like mm-hmm. no sense of humor whatsoever you're gonna have a tough time. Yep, you're not gonna get a lot of stuff. You know, I, I at least my family had a sense of humor. Yeah, and um, and I watched a ton of comedy growing up. Yeah, so I kind of understood you know, some of the pieces that were floating around. You know, there's sort of, sometimes there's formulas. You go A plus B. Oh, I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I've seen, I've seen some people that aren't funny have good shows. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. They kind of trip over themselves into a good show. What's your favorite bit throughout the ages? Or your favorite show, let's say? Oh, gosh. Like an improv show? Or, or, or stand-up, I guess. Well, stand up. Oh, my, one of my stand up comedians, like a, a favorite stand up comedian. Well, Mitch Hedberg is one of the greatest. I never got to. See, oh yes, I did get to see him before he died. Yeah. Um, he was he was so good. He was one of the greatest. He died of drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just a shame. Uh, there's a great duo in Chicago called TJ and Dave, and uh, they've been doing a two person improv show for a long time. They're just yep the best in the game. They're so good. That's cool. Um, but I, I see you have tattoos. Yeah. Oh yeah. These are these are fresh. Are those fresh? Fresher than. Uh, I have not seen those before. Yeah, they're, they're, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I haven't seen you in like five years. I think. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, they got these all last year. All last year. Yeah. Why? Why last year? Uh, it's time for a reboot. Trying for a reboot, so you so you patted yourself because you got them right on the tops of your hands. Yeah, that way I don't forget. Forget you have one that says <laughs> Psalm thirty one. Yeah, I can give you the gist of it. All right, what's the gist? Um, you, you, by the way, if you put a tattoo on the top of your hands, you're gonna get asked questions probably on a regular basis. Well, and that was some, <laughs> that was something I I thought that might be okay so long as I can simplify what they mean. Okay into sound bites that might be useful for people who are curious, mm-hmm. right? So Psalm 31, like all the Psalms are pretty, pretty long-winded. Um, not to say that they're frivolous, but they're long. So you didn't want to put the whole Psalm. <laughs> well, it, was, it wasn't the whole Psalm that made me think, that, that reached me. Okay. It was this one particular part. So I, I had, you know, really kind of without drinking and doing drugs, although I almost, like, skidded my teeth, did that again. I went away for a while, put myself in a sober living situation. Yeah, yeah. When was and that? That was in Pennsylvania yeah. last uh, February 2017. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. like, let's let's really do this thing now. Um, and why did you, you just felt like you were unstable or something? A whole lot of painful shit blew up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but you didn't drink? And, no, it didn't. But there was the old solution again said, hey, remember me. And, um, you know, instead, instead was like, let's, let's start again. Um, and like, you know, I, I think sometimes people get later into life and they have that fear of like, well, what if, if I drop everything and hit pause? Like, do I have time for that? And that was, that was, part of it but as soon as I got there I was like this is the only thing in the world I should be doing right now and so while I was there and life was changing radically and swiftly um, I read that psalm and there was a part of it that said praise be to the Lord for he showed his wonderful love to me when I was like a besieged city in my alarm I cried out I am cut off from your sight but you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help 
So I was experiencing that thing of like, I thought maybe I'd blown life so bad that there was no one to call out to. But the minute, the minute I kind of meekly went, uh, help, it was like, got you. Mm. There was, there was a response of love, like, you know, I, that I'd not ever experienced. Um, and I was like, that would be good as a reminder that if you, if you think you've ever fucked it up too bad, you probably haven't. Good to know. Mm. Right? This, that's like, um, this one I designed. Yeah. It's a symbol. I designed it. It's like a circle with a diamond and some ish. Yeah. uh, Lines in the kind of, kind of. Yeah. And then some, what's on the outside here? So the lettering, uh, there's, there's this bit of, there's a sentence from, uh, some recovery literature that says the verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. So like going back to the conversation we were having about, you know, this, this whole lifelong thing of fear. Well, like the antidote there is not necessarily to stop being afraid, but, but to get courage. Well, how the hell do you get that? You have to have some faith that if you apply that courage, you know, it'd be better or that, or that you can, or that you'll be all right. And so that idea um, the verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. Like the next line in this in this book says, um, all all men of faith have courage. And they're not talking about any particular religion. They're saying, if if across the span of history you find people doing something courageous, it's because they had faith of some kind. Like not necessarily religious faith, but faith that they were up for the task, or faith that they'd get through it, or faith that the risk was worth it, or or, you know, faith that the God they believed in would see them through or something. And so that is, if I had to summarize that, it's, you know, here's what's required to not blow it all up again. So this one is, if you've blown it up, you'll probably, hey, it's, it's okay. Ask for some help. You, you, you've never blown it up so much that you're irredeemable. And this is like, yeah, but try not to fucking blow it up again. <laughs> So that's that's my one two combo. That's um, pretty good. And you have yeah. some other what other tattoos do you have? Do you have one on the side? This was uh yeah, this that? was um It's on the side of your hand. Says X X V. So that was one that uh I got with an ex of mine. And it was it oh, was it was symbolic of a date. Oh, but so it's, we didn't split it up like dates, so it's just XXXV. So it just says 35. And so I thought yeah, what I'd do like is tack. Super Bowl. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is tack a one onto it uh-huh. since I was 36 when we did the restart. When I was uh, like reboot. round two. Yeah. I that see, way it could have a fresh, fresh significance. Okay. Yeah. What other tattoos do you have? I've got this. It's just a basic. On your thumb. A dagger? Cross. Or a cross. Yeah. <laughs> looks like a dagger. Looks like a jailhouse <laughs> cross, right? Like looks, looks like looks like uh I gave it to myself. Did you ever get arrested? Idea. Yeah. 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 What did you what you what drunk uh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Drinking stuff. Yeah. Fighting. Yeah. Yeah. All that. Well, no jail time ever. Yeah. Ever. Which is good. Yeah. Um New drinking days. Did yeah. you have, what was, so you got sober in 22? I got so, yeah, 2003. 2003. So what happened? What was your, did you reach a low? Definitely. Like it had been, it had been, the lows were accruing and stacking up. Sure. It gets worse and worse. And worse. Yeah, all the time. And then there was this one event in particular. It was two days after my 20, 22nd birthday. And like I hadn't slept yet. It was up just you know, taking shit and drinking and got into this really god awful breakup phone call with the girl I was seeing at the time. You know, we were living together in Hollywood and like crying, yelling, just this awful mess of a breakup phone call. And I hung up the phone and I was sitting not like at but in the middle of uh, the Ralph's parking lot on Poinsettia and Sunset. 
and like hung up from this call of like <laughs> I've blown it it's all and was, like there was just this moment of how the fuck did I get here I didn't choose I didn't decide uh, and looked down and there was a, you know at that point like a two thirds drunk bottle of pop off vodka like the really good six dollar shit and, <laughs> you know um, the authentic vodka sure and uh was really fucking alarmed, man, was like, I've known this thing has, has been scary. I've known that when I try to either moderate or stop, it doesn't go well. Zero success. No matter, no matter what kind of promises I make to myself or others, no matter if I swear something off or if I say, you know, maybe just two tonight or, you know, I'm not going to drink alcohol, just you know, drink a bottle of promethazine and smoke weeds. Like at some point, you know, it's all, it's all being fucked up. And then at some point it's like, you know, bottle in the uh, promethazine in. It's like somebody gives you a beer. You're not going to say, no, no, not, you know, tonight I'm not drinking. It's, it was like, I couldn't, I couldn't stop. And there had been plenty of times when I had sworn to myself and others, I won't anymore. Right. But this moment was like, Geez, man, there ain't a lot left. Like, I was getting kicked out of the acting school I was at at the time. Which was? Uh, the first place I went was called the Stella Adler Academy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was getting kicked out of there was, I think, in the conversation. I think we patched it up, but it was like, no more apartment, no more relationship. Um, had really, Had really just become a burden on on my family and like the trust was totally broken, was physically not doing great and kept having really, really close calls with, you know, like violence that I probably wouldn't have made it out of, like that I wasn't equipped for just because of the knucklehead shit I was doing to keep, keep these habits up. Or there were some really close calls with the law that would have been more than uh, you know, a slap on the wrist, and and I knew that, and I was like, I gotta stop, I gotta stop. And people around me were saying, you gotta stop. And that Christmas before, my sister, I guess I came in really drunk, and she had like one of her first boyfriends over, and I just started grilling the dude and being mm. a dick, and and she stood up, and uh, she's she's awesome, man. She's a really reasonable, level-headed person too. And in this fit of tears, was like, you're drunk, you're a fuck up. This doesn't work. You don't have to be that way. We love you so much, but like, that's that's what you are, and we all know it. And, it was, and I remember, you know, I was like, oh, what the hell does she know? And like, it all just kind of started growing. But when I hung up that phone with a phone call that started in my apartment, and looked around, and to my shock, was sitting crying, you know, uh, on the blacktop in the middle of the fucking day, the Ralph's parking lot, and something in me had said get in the car, something in me had said, go get the bottle, something in me had said, you know, show them your ID. And none of it was on record. It was like something in me went and did that without my consent. Like that, that's a hyperbolic way to describe it, but something went, well, here's what we do. Right. Without me saying, you know, you I'm gonna go to pilot. autopilot. Yeah, yeah. And then it was this snapping out of it sense of like, oh shit, like, and I was really, really scared of like, if the autopilot's going, what's next, man? And um, some people had reached out to me before and they, they were young guys that were sober and they'd said, um, uh, you know, if you ever want to check this thing out, let us know. And I was like, or something? yeah, 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 exactly. And I was like, oh, that's real sweet of them. But like, I don't have a problem. Like things go badly from time to time, but shit, that's, that's how it goes. I'm not like you guys. And in that moment, like, that open, non-judgmental invitation to, like, come get what had worked for them was really, really attractive. So my strategy was uh, I'll go to this place where people gather to get sober from alcohol. I'll learn what they, what they know. And then I'll go apply that to my drinking. <laughs> right. Yeah. That was that. Was, <laughs> How can I still drink? Totally. Right? That's the idea. Like, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go get out of hell. Yeah, right. And like, I'm still gonna drink. I gotta get back to purgatory. Pur yeah. Purgatory's good enough. We'll stay right yeah, here yeah. in the middle. And I really thought like maybe they had some 
kind of like Gnostic insight into how to be a better drunk or something. Right. And so my plan was to go pick up their tips on being a better drinker. Right. Uh, let things chill out and apply it. And what happened instead was... Uh, maybe light beer. Yo, oh, I'd already tried all that. <laughs> I'd already tried all that. Right. Like every, well, only this or only that or only this plus this or, or perhaps only Thursdays. Or, you right. know, it's definitely... I'll add juice. Definitely never Thursday. I'll like, add juice to the vodka. Yeah, that'll make it. Yeah, it'll make bad. it weaker. Um, <laughs> and so, and like I had, I had been, the courts had made me go to a, some meetings in high school before, and like I just couldn't. Oh, okay. you got couldn't arrested relate. in high school, and they made that you. one was that wasn't. F- I don't think that was for a full out arrest, but I got for that. I think I got cuffed and like. Um, was issued this minor in possession of alcohol thing, and then uh, part of it was community service, and part of it was you had to go to these uh, these meetings, and like, and I just remember looking there saying, like, what the hell's this got to do with me? It's a bunch of old jailbirds and mm. shit like that, smoking cigarettes, and like, I just I was tuned out. And the difference this time was I went I went to a, a place where guys were going to get better, and whatever the difference was, uh, whatever differences existed between me and the people that were sharing their stories were just totally overridden by how familiar they all were. So like, you know, this guy's old and this guy's young and this guy's gay and this guy's straight and this guy's a successful businessman and this guy just got out of fucking prison yesterday. And, you know, this guy's tatted up and this dude looks like Michael Douglas from Wall Street and this guy's a big shot in this thing and this guy's, you know... Uh, brain dead from a lifetime of drinking and can't mm. spell his name mm. and and yet they all would say something and there was just this commonality and this like and to the person there like it's better it's better to not and um so then then like I was like all right I want that and it I, I remember having a real strong sense and people can have these and they can be very foolish. But I remember having a real strong sense of like, I'm not going to drink again. And like, that's, that's not how necessarily recovery works is like, you just get struck with a lightning bolt yeah. feeling. And as it turns out, you know, 14 years later, I was like, all I want to do is drink. And I didn't. But the, that thing was back and it yeah. was, meaning there's, there's, upkeep involved but like I, it was it was really a really strong sense of uh, alright I'm done hmm. with that did you go to AA I mean uh, a rehab um, no I've never been to rehab I've never been to rehab so no. you just did AA got sponsored did steps well from what I know about AA is it's supposed to be anonymous oh <laughs> uh, I, I, but it sounds I, like <laughs> we've been meetings well <laughs> uh yeah, I went to I went to meetings. Yeah, twelve step meetings. And, I uh, go to Al Anon. Oh, cool. That's it's supposed to be an Al Anon too, but I, I talk. About Fuck it. that! Not tonight, <laughs> baby. Um, yeah, so the, you you like like this the yeah, steps no, are like yeah. Good God, man. Yeah. So let me ask you this about those about th- those steps, right? Yeah. About the twelve steps. It's, it's clearly, like, depending on the meetings you're going to, they're targeted at a real specific problem, which doesn't take too long for, for us to realize, like, oh, the problem is just me, mm-hmm. right? Or, or, like, for example, for me, the problem is not uh, alcohol. In fact, like, for me, the solution is alcohol. The problem right. is uh, this life ain't quite right. I'd better adjust. I'd better get it just so I can handle it and everything. Right. And then, so Russell Brand comes out with this book that at first I was pretty cynical about because I, you know, those, those programs have helped a lot of people and according to their own literature, they're saying like, hey man, keep us out of the press and shit like that. And like, I, I respect, respect that a lot. So Russell Brand comes out with this thing and at first I was kind of iffy about it. And then it dawned on me, since I've seen those steps, I've thought, who the hell wouldn't this be good for? This you don't have stuff. to be an alcoholic. hundred percent. Yeah, I think right? that all the time. Like I think that all the time. And I really started to have a lot of admiration for what he was doing, which is saying, 
you know, the isms and schisms and actions and all this stuff are like multiplying and remultiplying daily. Yeah. In this time, it's like, here's a new one poof, blowing up. And that gives birth to four new things that people can't get out from one another, yeah. that people can't stop fucking doing. And he went, cool, here's, here's, here's a blueprint. I'm borrowing it from these people. It was innovated here. I'm not giving you that, so you don't have to, you know, I'm giving you, here's what they do to get well. World, take it if you want it. Yeah. And those principles are just sound, man. They're really sound. Yeah. And my nature, which is a, a fearful, a fearful, um, by the way, I'm not saying this is the all I've ever been is like a fearful, self-deceiving uh, fool. No, you were. But like, a, that's the a, pitfall, you man. Were an, you were an asshole too. I'd a say. total <laughs> asshole. But like, and it's, what I'm saying is, oh, yeah, straight up. <laughs> well, the guys at this meeting used to say, I'd say, you know what I think the problem is, and they'd always cut me off. But it was in a jovial way. I'd say, you know what I think the problem is. Like, yeah, you're a selfish fucking prick. These old tough guys. And yeah. I loved it because they were giving it to me straight, man. Yeah, yeah. Straight up. Of course that's the problem. <laughs> Mix in a little fear and a little pride and some ambition and uh, some dishonesty. And like, yeah, you got a nice fucking mess. Yeah. But like, yeah, right at the center is, yeah, I'm a selfish prick. Jeez, I didn't know that. I didn't mean to be. I don't want to be. I don't want to be. I, don't, I also don't have any... Big time. That's, I mean, that's the only way any of this stuff's effective, right? It's yeah. like... I don't want to be a jerk or this or that, so how can I change that? Right. And, and for the guy and the gal who are like, I want to change it, but all you've got is, you know, the equipment you've had for a lifetime. Right. What do I do? What do I do? Where do I start? And, it, and here's what's really crazy is we don't say, what do I do? We say, I know what to do. Right. <laughs> but it's coming out of the broken machinery. And so what I really, really value, man, as much as any fucking thing in my life is that there's something out there that if I'm willing, is like, here's not only the way out of, of the fire you've started, which is called your life, but here's a way into what seems to be missing anytime you see a problem among human beings. Here's a way into selflessness, consideration, Honesty, uh, courage, um, sacrifice, consistency. It's like, oh shit, I wasn't even aiming that high. Like, I just wanted to act and not be on fire. Mm. You know? I, I think about the steps, and, um, and since I've been kind of doing them and uh, going to meetings and stuff, I think to myself, oh, this is good if you can't get a therapist. Because you mm -hmm. can do the steps, get a sponsor or two, and yeah, uh, yeah. and do the steps, and that's your therapy. That can right. be your therapy right there. If you, and it's free. Well, it's free. That's the other thing, man, is like, again, I'm not going to mention the program just out of respect for it, but in these programs, like we're talking about, there's a kind of harmonious, like, you know, utopia might be a stretch, but there's there's a civilization and a society within it that's free of leadership, that's free of competition, that's free of um, harsh judgment and exclusion. It's like a merry band of equals, no matter where you're at elsewhere in the social yeah. realm. And I'm like, geez, I, I don't, um, I, I've not seen that. And it doesn't matter where you go. You, if you go to Kentucky, if you go to California, you go to New York, you go to England, you go to Philly, you go to Texas, it's like, there it is. There's that thing. Mm -hmm. There's that thing. And I don't anywhere. see it anywhere else. And it's like, good God, that's special, man. And like, um, so A, there's nobody that's disqualified from participating. And I don't just mean like you're allowed through the door. I mean like you'll be taken in. You'll be taken in. And you'll be taken seriously. Yeah. Um, the help is legitimate. And what I like about it is it doesn't nullify, you know, let's say you're, let's say you're a really religious person and that's part of it for you. Like it doesn't cancel that out. Let's say you're not religious at all. It doesn't cancel that out. Let's say you, you, 
also want some psychological help. It ain't an either or, right? It's incredibly flexible and adaptable. And um, I, I, dude, I can't tell you, especially this, especially as an adult, to look at those principles through the eyes of an adult that really, really needed it. Um, and having had some time to sort of like assess the alternatives that are out there, including the ones that fly out of my insane mind, mm. or this might fix it. I'm like, wow, dude, this is a, this is a gift to mankind for, for people who, like you said, people who want it, uh, it's there. It'll be, it'll, it'll do right by you, mm -hmm. you know? How do you, how do you feel like today? How do you, do you still feel awesome. like there's a lot of work to do still? Yes, yes, yes. Where do you want to be? Good question. Um, but again, I want to be precise about how I answer it. And not just be like, good, dude. I feel good, yeah, dude. Yeah. It's great. It's like, okay. You know, just whatever, man. <laughs> um, all right, so here's what, here's what my days are like today. Uh, I pop up, like in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, just okay, is that good? <laughs> and kind of do a version of uh, all right, Dad, God, report for duty. Here's what I know I'm like usually. So for today, will you kind of direct my thinking? And will you be very clear about the actions I ought to take and the ones I ought not take? And maybe help me out with that. Also, help me to keep an eye out for maybe where I could be of use to other people because that was never part of the game plan before. It's like I liked other people, I cared about them. I even knew how to be there for other people. But the fear thing kind of makes you go, well, I gotta look out, I gotta make sure. Um, and I was always on my fucking mind, right? A lot of my problems start with I'm always on my mind. So where, you know, little ways, big ways, helping other guys out, maybe go through these transformational things we're talking about. Maybe just being a good listener to a total stranger. Maybe making a call just to say, how you doing? Mm -hmm. um, and that has, that's brought me a quality of, of life. And a long way to go, sure, yeah. There's still a lot of regret to get out from under. There's still a lot of, um, I wrestle with a low opinion of myself, man. You know, and, and it's being repaired and it's being healed. But like that's been there for a long time, and then I backed it up with a lot of the, a lot of behavior that that I don't admire in other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I still have that thing where I quit on myself if I if I'm afraid that I'm not up for the job, whatever the job may be. Like I don't mean work, work, but like I I still count myself out a lot and withdraw from the things that would maybe help me step into my potential, but that's on the radar and I'm responding differently when I catch it, right? So without just kind of saying like, I just want to stay this path, like part of the answer is I want to stay this path. What I also hope is that it brings me to a new place and I'm starting to experience it creatively and that that combination will open things up uh, professionally in a new way to take a new attitude towards all this and one where it's not about, um, geez, was I, was I up for it or was I good enough? But like, hey man, since I'm, since I'm here, how can I help? Like, I'm not, I'm not afraid anymore on the, with, with the acting stuff of like, did I uh, come off like a bad actor and I used to be pretty afraid of that. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's not my business. You know, I'll do my I'll do my work and I'll do my best. And like my business really ought to be, hey, these people brought me in. Like, am I useful to them? Where could I be most useful to them? Um, and I just I'd wrapped up a movie in the summer and I took that attitude and it was like, I finished it and was like, holy shit! I wonder how the acting went. Like, and it wasn't because I was negligent of, of the work that needed to be done. It's like the day was really filled with, and I was, I was saying and praying, like, kind of to myself throughout the day, like, show me, show me how I can help, show me how I could be of use. 
and that pressure of, but uh, how will I come off, was just gone. And it was a great time. And, I, and I, I felt like there were a lot of opportunities where I got to be of use in a lot of different ways. And um, then it was time to go home. And I was like, it wasn't like that before. It was, you go do something and spend the next three days wondering, was it shit? Right. And could I salvage the fact that that was shit because this other scene's coming up and maybe if I'm fucking extra good and like, and like we never follow through and say, well, like, all right, and then what? Then what? What's the big if that I'm thinking about, right? Like, mm-hmm. if I could do just good enough, what? What? You'll be all right for all time or like... Uh, you know, you'll never, you never, you'll never feel rejection again, or you'll never be scared again. Like, what am I even talking about? I never bothered to answer that question. What is this? If I could just then, what, like, what, what is that thing that I'm going after a million miles an hour, or retreating from because I'm afraid I'm not up for it? And like, as it turns out, for me, it's a big, it's a big head game. Yeah. I can pretty well quantify and, and measure like. Am I being useful or not? I can look at actions and say, that seems to have helped. And I, I can kind of draw an idea of like, how'd that go? Well, I, I helped out a lot and I didn't harm any. That'd be cool to build, to build like chapter two of a career. You know, think things have, things have been scary, dude. That thing Deborah's talking about, like at the highest point I've experienced in my career, um, I stepped out and was like, I'm going to, I'm going to start a school and uh, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm glad I did when I did. Are you not doing that anymore? No, because yeah, for, for a lot of reasons, but like, I was afraid that acting, my acting career would fade and be taken away from me. Mm. And I, this isn't why I started the school, but here's how I ended up using the school to deal with that fear is. I'm doing something every day I know is worth something, is valuable to other people. And if I get to say, well, I went and did this instead of that, they can never take it away from me, right? Like, that, that wasn't my motivation. But once I was there, it was like, I'm not going to try to keep trying in this, uh, in, in this profession or in the industry where I might hear some no's because there's a yes and this is good right in front of me every day. And that way I'll never fade into nothingness. And, like, nobody fades into nothingness, man. People just start doing different shit. Right. Um, so I put myself on time out, dude, for three, three and a half years. And then the last year and a half has mostly been, you know, starting starting life on, on new terms. And I, I believe... Uh, I believe I'll be guided to the the opportunities that I'm supposed to be when that stuff is solid enough and when, when I'm ready. And there's been like tastes and something like that, but there hasn't been like, well, here's the new series. And rather than being, you know, that'd be nice. And believe me, there are days when I'm like, where the fuck is it? How do I, you know, how do I do that again? It's like, uh, I didn't really do it the first time, man. It was sort of given. You know, and then and then I did my best from there, and so um, that's a that's a really long convoluted answer, but 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 stay on and increase this path of these new principles to guide my life, and put those things above all else, and see the way that turns into a new chapter, and uh, creatively and professionally. And you're you're very religious. I wouldn't say that, actually. Oh, you wouldn't say that? Okay. I would say... um, Psalm 31 tattooed on your hand. Yeah, but at least two (laughs) religions could fight over that. Um, No, I would... I would. I mean, I'm I'm a Christian, and what I mean by that is not... um, It bums me out what it's come to mean, or the way it bristles people when they hear it now. And that it's... it's, it's, Here's what I mean by that. It's like... uh, I, I... believe in the gospels of Jesus Christ like I don't adhere to politicized religion mm. I don't look at the world through a, a, a lens of who's good and who's bad and like the reason I say gospel based 
believer in, in Christ is like, take a look at them, man. There's the busted people. And then there's the hyper-religious people. And the busted people are open to love and the hyper-religious people hang them on the cross and kill them, right? And I don't find anywhere in that book the demand for religion from the God of, that, of the Bible, let's say. It, there's, there's a call for relationship. And I'd say the first three quarters of the book is pretty good evidence that like somebody like me probably needs that. Because I look through the first three quarters, I'm like, oh, that's all the bonehead shit I do. Well, trust me, I've got it. Or, well, they'll never know. Or like, you know, and it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe I could use some help. Um, so I don't, I don't, uh, I don't. I don't think of myself as religious. It's like uh, I know. I know through experience that description of man that you find, let's say, in the Bible. You know. You know. There's various forms, but like that resonates. And I go, yeah, that sounds like me. And I've also experienced the the grace and the love that Christ starts to offer people in the New Testament. And I also I also have like a loose rein on that. And I'm open and accepting to the people who might say, you're out of your fucking mind. It's like, I get it. This is, this is not an easy thing to pin down and, and be absolutely right about. But I'm, I'm not uncertain about what I've experienced. Um, and more is being revealed to me about that all the time. Mm. Like the God, the God that I, that I know today is constantly showing me more. It's usually, I go broader and deeper than you thought. Meaning, uh, anytime you see people saying in my name, uh, not those over there, they ain't talking about me. Right? Right. That's a relief. Uh, do you, were you raised Christian? Yeah. Your parents are Christian? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, but again, not religious. Like we went to church, we believe, uh, In religion classes, all that stuff. No, I, I think that's mostly a Catholic that's thing. Why, that's why I did. Yeah. Yeah. The religion classes. But like on, on my own, um, I like to soak up as much as I can about it. And you know, thankfully there's been a couple thousand years of, over, over that couple thousand years, there's been some really pretty damn impressive minds to be updating not what what it means but updating how we might grasp it and wrestle with it or, or you know uh, and the most updated version is, is oddly enough I think something like the original version which is you probably you're probably more off track than you care to admit but at the same time you're more loved than you could possibly fucking imagine. It's like, all right. To me, that's the gospel. Yeah. Like that crossroads of uh, you're further off than you'll ever see. You're more busted, right? Mm -hmm. You're more of a selfish fucking prick, as they told me at the other thing. <laughs> um, but don't be alarmed. In the midst of that, you're more loved than you have the capacity to grasp. And... I'm like, all right, that that resonates. Do you look at people that use the Bible and Christianity yeah. as a, a weapon? Yeah, against there other are people? people that do that. Yeah, and then the you go, oh, damn you, <laughs> why are you doing that? Yeah, big time, man. I remember and politicize it and all that stuff. I, I yeah. Big time. And I used to take it really personally because I was afraid of what people would think of me when I said, you know, I, be I'm, I believe in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I was afraid that people would say, oh, well, we've seen you at work. You're, you're the, oh, the Westboro Baptist Church guy. Like, I remember, I remember all of us pulling up to the SAG Awards one year mm -hmm. um, and they're just being the pickets. And like, there was... There was the name of the of the one who's opened his arms to all being used to say this particular sexual preference is hated by God and burning in hell. And I wanted to fucking crawl under a rock, dude, because yeah. where'd you get it? It's not. Um, 
But here's a new thing, and like this might not be a popular answer. As I used to just knee-jerk respond and say, fuck those people, right? There's a new thing that's suddenly saying, haven't you been totally desperate, scared, and wrong about me before too? That maybe, maybe the worst antidote to those people would be to group them all together and, and say, well, fuck them. Like, isn't that an awful lot like the problem I have with what they're doing to others? Aren't those people who, probably out of fear, pain, who knows what, have felt secure through grabbing onto hatred and dragging, dragging the concept of love through it? And something in me, like, in no way approves of it, but the part of me that's compassionate, that's growing, is like, Jesus, those must be some really, really torn up people, man. Yeah, oh, for sure. Those are some really beat up people. And speaking of the, uh, what is it, the... What, the Westboro Baptist Westboro Church. Westboro yeah. Baptist. Um, I remember years ago, that mother was on with her children. Right. On the Stern Show, on the Stern Show. Right. And those kids... Those little kids were you saying the most fucked up things you ever Warped. heard. Warped stuff. Now, cut to today, one of those kids escaped. Good. And is kind of um, ostracized from her family because now she, is, she does not have those beliefs anymore. Yep. Um, it, it's, it's amazing she got away. Good, man. You know? And like I used, I used to want something like retribution for those people because I thought if it's bad to be hateful and bigoted, let's say, uh, my judgment was it's hyper, hyper uh, malevolent to then defend that through the name of God, right? It, it like, I'm like, that's some, that's some hardcore, that's next level evil shit, right? Right. Why don't you just have the nuts to say, I don't fucking like you. Right. He's still right? saying it, the book says that. Why on earth drag this in? But there was some comfort in, in reading, like in the, in the Gospels, there's this part that say, like, you know, many will come in my name. You want a litmus test? You will know by the way they love each other. And like, all right, let's say you're a non-religious person. And I understand their plight too, man. Like, these these are not easy things there's a lot to wrestle with let's say you think it's all bunk dude that the idea of god is is foolish let's say you even resent the idea of god i don't know too many people who have a problem with the idea of you'll know these people by the way they love each other mm -hmm. that that's the litmus test for where somebody's at yeah like that's pretty the problem with the universal i guess with the hateful Christians mm -hmm. is that they're the loudest and they get the most attention. And so they end up being the representatives yep. of Christianity. Yep. And that could go for any religion, really. Oh, man. I think it could go... I think it... It, it tends to go towards, like, any tribe, right? Like, you look at, you look at this... The two-party system that we have today and... I heard somebody say something that, I, that really opened me up. And every, anytime I get opened up lately, it's a pretty good sign, right? Mm. I haven't been a terribly political person. I've especially not been a, I'm with this party or that party. I've, I've been, I don't know, uh, curious more than anything else. But like, I heard somebody say like, look, man, it's a damn good thing there's a right and the left until they go into their extremes. And in fact, they're necessary for each other. And the example that he used was, um, generally people on the left have a personality trait called openness. It's one of the big five traits that uh, the psychology came up with to measure personalities. Hmm. They have something called openness. And generally people that are more conservative have a personality trait of orderliness, right? And so he said, you're going to have the innovators and the good ideas coming from the open people. Yeah. But you don't want that guy to be CEO, that gal to be CEO of that company. Because it's going to be a, a creative free-for-all. Hmm. Right? 
this guy or gal over here on the conservative side, they're not going to be daring and risking and stepping into chaotic, risky, scary territory to innovate. They're just going to be trying to keep it together. So they're not going to give you the new iPhone. But once this cat over here comes up with the iPhone, that'd be a good person to oversee the day-to-day detailing of, of how the company uh, goes about its business. Right. And so there's this opportunity for the right and the left to sharpen each other's strong points, challenge each other's weaknesses. And just like you said, like you see in all religions, who do you hear the most from? I think on both sides are the extremists. Yeah, the loudest. Yeah, man. And it's like, I don't think that represents most people, but I guess I am a little curious about the more... The more those people are given voice because of, of the technology and the time we live in, will more people feel like, well, that's what you have to be to be either this or that. Right. Um, and a pretty, a pretty cursory gla- uh, glance of history will tell you that wouldn't be in our best interest right. for both sides to go full tilt disco extremism. And, like, yeah. and so I kind of like sitting here in the middle saying where are the good ideas the bad ideas are so obvious usually yeah but still people latch on to bad ideas too with their with uh, their tribal shit man like yeah with that like uh i hate this person because they're not a part of my tribe like, right. what, what what is your tribe what fuck you yeah. I'm like, it's it's I, like part of the pleasure of this night man is like it's so cool to have a uh, the opportunity for a real curiosity to unfold in, in a conversation, man. And like, I, I, I rarely in one-to-one see or experience people have this, have this like nasty, violent response to one another where they disagree, mm. right? Whether it's politics, religion, um, sports, whatever. Yeah. But you put them in front of the crowd or they become the representative of their tribe, or there's anyone else out there to witness it at all, and the knives come out. You know what I mean? Like, I, I remember as a kid, and you probably did too, like, people who, whose parents may have uh, had different political views than your parents, let's say, uh, it wasn't cause to block them from life right, right, right. or condemn them wholesale. It was like, well, yeah, if you like, if anything, it was little jokes, like appreciation of like, you know, somebody, at, you know, back in the 90s had a Clinton sign, somebody had a Bush sign and, right. and they'd say, really? Yeah, well, it's interesting. And like, they carry on saying, well, the big thing though is how's this, how's this country going to turn out? Yeah. And I think the idea behind most religions is the big thing is how, how is this human race going to turn out? That seems to be the big underlying point of, of most religious thought is uh, it would be best if you all dot, dot, dot. Right. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how we all turn out, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Are you optimistic or terrifying or, or, or pessimistic? I, these last couple of years, I've been pretty pessimistic. Yeah. And I've, I've been really disappointed in a lot of people, yep. including my own family. Uh-huh. Um, you know, just to, you know, I, it's funny because politically I didn't know, I wasn't into politics much for most of my, I didn't start, I didn't vote till my 30s. Yeah. Uh, I just voted in my first midterms. Yep. Um, but at, what I know about politics now, I would say growing up, I was leaning more conservative. Mm-hmm. I was probably a moderate conservative. Yep. Then evolved into independent yeah. Now leaning more liberal. Yeah. Um, and I, I was raised in like a conservative, mostly conservative area and yeah. household. Uh, so that's where some of those thoughts came in. But you know, when I was growing up, I didn't, I wasn't informed or anything. I just had, I just had opinions that were based on no information, really. <laughs> you know. Um, you weren't alone. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And I was, and I was like that for most of my life. And yeah. now I feel yeah. like I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot about politics and history and stuff in the last few years. Yeah. 
and and it's and it's kind of horrifying <laughs> like yeah. going, oh my god how did i you know i was much less stressed out uh yeah politically when i didn't know anything i was in uh blissful ignorance mm -hmm. um but now that i'm reading articles and learning things and with my own morals and what i believe yeah, is right or wrong or whatever you know like my uh, when Trump, you know for an example when trump made fun of a, a disabled reporter yeah um during his campaign you know i'm a disabled person right i have other disabled people in my family right I was like, what the fuck? I mean, on top of all the other stuff he's said and done and all that stuff. Yeah. I was, I was pretty uh, horrified, at, but I was maybe more horrified that people in my family still voted for him uh -huh. and chose to compartmentalize that or, or whatever. Uh, right, right, whatever, right. Whatever choices they made for it. Because I do think that if he instead made fun of a blind man, mm -hmm. they might go, hey, wait a minute, that's Fuck not okay. You. Right, right. But for some reason, it's okay for him to make fun of this other guy. You know what I mean? Yes, um, yeah. So I was I was really heartbroken by by that. Um, and, it's, and, and people, you know, and now he's president. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, so I was like, oh, because I didn't, I didn't think he, I was like, well, he's not going to be president. You know, I was the guy who was going, well, it's hilarious that he's running for president because he said he'd run for like 15 years. Dude, I was the guy who, if I encountered somebody acting like Chicken Little, running around, the world's going to end, the world, and he's going to get elected. Yeah. I was going, will you fucking relax, man? <laughs> Just pause and just say out loud what it is you're afraid of. You're afraid Donald Trump's going to become president? <laughs> you're fine. Relax. And That's never going to happen. It's pretty far out, man. And it's, it's like... Um, I see... He's the To me, he's the least interesting piece of the equation. Like... People are pretty sophisticated, but if we're going to veer away and just oversimplify someone... Here's my assessment of that guy. I don't know enough about his policies to get into his policies, but like as an observer of what, what that guy reveals to people about himself mm. is he's the, he's the kid who doesn't care if what you're saying about him is good or bad so long as you're thinking and talking about him. Right. The child, right? Yeah. Um, he never grew out of that 11-year-old mentality or whatever. Same shit. Yeah. Either a teacher saying, A plus, good job, or um, did you hide the eraser? It's like, I don't care. It's the same high. Right. It's all about me. You know, you know like... Um, I didn't hide it. Hillary hid it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what eraser? Ha ha. How, how can I drag this out until lunch? Yeah. Um, and it's like... Then he goes and pranks to his friends or something. Yeah, that's not the kind of guy I like. Yeah. And... So there you go. There's that. And to me, that's the least interesting part of the equation. What's most interesting is watching people respond. And then what's like really interesting is saying, all right, so what's that got to do with me? Like, instead of saying, instead of saying, well, this side and that side, it's like, all right, here's, here's what I see. It's like, remember the acting book we were talking about? Like, maybe instead of here's how you make it the first thing you should do is here's how you fuck it all up, mm, right? Right, right. The response to this man seems to be eliciting not new and good ideas and solutions, but here's how to get so distracted and wrapped up in this cat um, that you don't make it. And so you have this, this trickster yeah. type. Right. Like if it was an archetype, you would be a trickster. He's a comic book villain. <laughs> and all the people, whether they agree with one another or not, that are that are given the charge of come up with the with the new thing to solve the new problem long term, the best way, imperfect as it may be, are having their energy absorbed with with this entanglement with one another over the trickster. Right. And I'm like, it's, it's, I've got to. So all right, how do I bring it home? I've got to make sure there's never a person, place, or thing that I'm so blindly for or so totally against mm. 
that my life becomes either defending or attacking that thing and all the useful things I could be doing fall to the wayside because I'm being totally fueled by that one fucking thing. Well, you may, you know, you were saying earlier of like, how can I be of service? Like right. even on an acting set. Right, right. Um, that's a good, that's mm-hmm. a good way of thinking about it just in general. Like how can I help other people yeah. and be useful? Yeah. Um, so check this out. Along those lines, it's kind of cool because I, I, every now and again, even when I wasn't in a good place, I think I did some things right. And so the, the day after the election it was when I had an acting school and this new group, maybe about 20 people, shuffled in and like, man, people were crying and people were hurt and people were scared, right? And, and I hadn't expected to see that. Um, but they were, and so I took a couple minutes at the top and said, let's talk about it, what, what, what's going on? And they said, you know, this guy is our fucking president. And as gently as I could, um, said, true, okay. I just sort of offered as an opinion and said, I, I would propose that the way we preside over ourselves daily is going to have a greater effect personally and then therefore collectively than whoever happens to be in office for the next four minutes, like short of pressing the big red button. And I think what that really was, was advice to myself that I wasn't ready to take yet Mm. of like, I've proven I can do way more damage to my little three foot circle of existence than anybody in office could. And that also means I could do more to improve that, hmm. right? And and modify it and reorient it so that maybe I could be of use to somebody else. And then I'm left with a decision. Am I most useful railing against that which I don't like? Well, I'll, I'll be dead honest. I prefer that. It feels fucking good, man. Like, watch any sports game and you'll see that. Yeah. The people railing against the other side yeah. or... <clears throat> you know, without treating it like it's totally inconsequential, without drowning it out and, and failing to consider the repercussions of it, might my, my energy best be spent at this particular chapter of my life right now with reorienting myself and then one to one saying, I'm here for you. How can I help? Right? And so far, it seems like right now, at this point in my life, like, that would be the more useful strategy for me. Even though it'd be a lot more fun to just like throw an egg. To vent. To, th- to vent, yeah, fuck yeah. 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 To vent. Well, that's and, what and, social and media is doing is it's a- way It's to the vent, right? Vent. And so for guys like, like, you know, hearing you kind of chart the course of your political uh, development and evolution, I'm, I'm somewhere right now in that, uh, what other options have we got? Because there's a lot, there's a lot that I think liberals have right, and there's some things I think conservatives have right. And I've been looking at like the Libertarian Party, which stands not a fucking snowball's chance in hell of electing a president. But I'm like, yeah, I was probably more libertarian. That, at one that point might too. that might be worth a shot. Mm-hmm. And the real answer is we don't fucking know, man. Right. But that might be worth a shot. It's like, you know, let people be by God and and respect that. But let's run a tight ship where, like, the thing we're all in could be could be uh, tightened up. Let's give it a shot, right? Yeah. And like, moderate liberal. I, I, yeah, something like that. Or like, I've I've heard the term classic liberal, where where the idea is essentially like, socially and personally, uh, stay the fuck out of it when it comes to how big we grow this government and the way we spend other people's money, like, let's be fiscally conservative. Like, I've heard that term socially liberal, fiscally conservative, mm. to describe libertarians. And I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I like the idea of that. Right. Um, or I like the idea of being open to it and saying... Let's do the research and let's... let's maybe it would help, maybe. Yeah. And it's cool to be in the maybe spot because it means the... I'm not tribed up enough right. where I can't be of use to people on either side, man. Sure. And, and that's my main interest. And uh, 
I might be the only person who thinks that has any value, but I'm experiencing the value, man. Like I'm, I'm, I'm present and here for my my friends and loved ones on either side of this thing. Uh, you know, I always want to hear, a, 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 like, if I was thinking, like, what would I, what would be my platform if I was going to mm-hmm. run for? And my platform, I think, would be, how can I help? It'd be like, this, Dude, how there can you go. I help save lives and and help people's quality of life? Bingo. Where, how can for the as many people as I can do it? Bingo. How, how can I do that? How can I do that? And then like, all right, so then what would the pitfalls be? Would well. You can't help everybody all the time. It would be, I think, defining help, right? Because, like, yeah, well, and, and that. you can't, Hey, you can't help people who don't fucking want it. Right. Right? But, like, how, how could I help this situation? You know, give people jobs. And then how could I not wages. let, how could I not insist that my reach, and this, I guess, would be the conservative side, how could I insist that my reach so that I can help, since we're prone to corruption, mm. grows so big that not only can I help, but I know exactly the help you need and it's your only option now. Mm. Like that's, that's the totalitarianism side of things that's dangerous. The, is, is, no, trust me, you need me, and you go from being helped to then dependent to then under my thumb. Right. Because I'm the fucking helper after all. And it's well, like, hopefully it doesn't get that <laughs> Well, that's why I think we need each other. I think right. that's why I think the sides ought to be perpetually be sharpening one another. Now, you're from Texas. Yeah. That's a conservative state. Yeah, yeah. Um, you must, I mean, when you go back, to, I mean, you're an actor. Yep. In New York City. Yep. Do, do they give you a lot of shit when you, do, or, or, or how does that work? They're pretty cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Texas is one of those places where, like you said earlier, uh, the loudest get right. the most attention. So somebody does some horrific uh, retrograde shit, right? And it's like, oh, good old Texas. And say, like, dude, go there, go there and say hi to somebody and see how it goes. And like, I, I mean, everybody go there. And... You, you'll find something that's far more welcoming than the way it's represented. Um, if Texas has a flaw, an obvious one, it's uh, pride. Hmm. Why do you say that? Well, I think because it went from being a band of settlers to a nation within 20 years. I think its origins are yeah, we walked, we walked into something, you know, half the size of continental Europe. It was, at the time, being ruled by the most powerful government in the Western world, in Mexico, and was populated with, with the most aggressive tribe of natives on the continent, with the Comanches, right? So newcomers weren't exactly welcome and this tribe of like, you know, these groups of about 10,000 people rolled into that situation and toppled it on its head and went, we're a country now. And like, so at its point of origin, it was people going like, fuck yeah, we did that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like in the Articles of Confederation with the US, it's, uh, I think it's still the only state that in its Articles of Confederation it has permission to secede without it being a declaration of war. So it's done these things to make itself special. And on one hand, okay, it is. On the other hand, if all you do is rest on the laurels of that, you're a dick. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, boy, we were going a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I didn't, I th- I didn't even oh. get, I didn't even talk to you about, like, True Blood or anything oh, like right, that. Oh, right, right. Um, which I... All that say. shit's out there. We talked... <laughs> <laughs> what was the same for that? Can I ask you, though? Yeah. I saw um, uh, Escape from... Mm. Dana Mora. Dana Mora. Are you yeah. in more of it? Um, I'm only in the sixth episode. You're only in one episode? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, uh, play, a, play a real guy. I can't say exactly who he is, cause, okay. but... Um, 
Dude, it was it was such an awesome experience. How was Ben Stiller as a director? Terrific, terrific. He's he's maybe I would say him and David Ayer are, are the most detail oriented people that I've ever worked with. Mm. There was like there was a moment we were shooting a scene after a really really long day. It was just walking through a kitchen, right? And Stiller's always like tilting the glass just so, I mean, everything. Mm. And we rolled a couple and he goes, hang on. And he walked over to the fridge and there was a fridge magnet that you couldn't even read because it was dark. Like, it's just like a moonlit kitchen. And he looks at this fri fridge magnet for this auto repair center that, like, props had gotten. And they'd gotten the town's name right and everything. And he said, I want somebody to Google search and see if that was the area code in 2002. Mm. And everybody went, Ben, man. He's like, no, do it. Like, no, it is. And there were even locals that were like, no, that's right. And they looked it up, and it's like, sure enough, in 2005, it changed to this or that. And he's like, lose it. I'm like, great. And he's like, but we need something in that, you know, this three-inch space now. What could we? And, like, cut something out and made it, and it's like... It's a little obsessive. A little obsessive, but ultimately it's like, I'm not going to miss an opportunity to care. Yeah. Right? And, there, and, and maybe if his attitude about it had been different, it would have been obsessive to a fault. Yeah. But it was, it was almost like acting out the reminder of like, hey, man, we get one shot at this and this is, this is valuable. Yeah. And I just thought he was a blast, man. That's cool. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Like, uh, well, do you want to plug anything? Do you want to plug any social media or any upcoming projects, websites? No, I think I'm good. You're good? Yeah, I think okay. so. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. Dude, it's been so fun. So it's been so good seeing you. Let's again. call this part one. And some other time, <laughs> let's do it. I'll, we'll do a part two. Great. We'll talk about, like, like I'm acting stuff. Uh, uh, of Mice and Men and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, cool, I mean? cool. Uh, okay. Thank awesome, you. Buddy. Pleasure. It was great. And scene. Scene. There you go, folks. That was my talk with Jim Perrick. Thank you so much, Jim, for talking with me. I'm so sorry, again, that it's taken me this long to get my shit together and, and release the podcast. Um, let's see. Uh, well, the sound might sound weird. Um, when I'm traveling, I have to use different uh, different equipment. So I'm sorry if uh, you know you had a hard time hearing me while talking to him or whatever. And if these intros and outros sound weird, it's because I'm doing that differently too. Um, so sorry about that. <laughs> Work in progress. It's only been six years I've been doing this. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you again for listening. Please go subscribe on iTunes and iHeartRadio. Uh, one more time, my socials are Twitter at EJ Scott and at EJ Podcast and EJ Scott 1106. EJScott.com is my website. Running Blind Documentary is on iTunes, Google Play, or Amazon. And I guess that's about it. Hey, thanks so much, guys. We'll see you next time.